James, are we all ready? It is. We are all set. Just okay, a, great. Okay, we're going to get started. Um, it's 11. Um, so welcome everyone to the Mary Frances Pitiano Dietary Supplement Research Practicum um, hosted by the National Institutes of Health Office of Dietary Supplements. I am Jamie Gash, a nutritional epidemiologist and the director of this intensive practicum. Throughout this program, we will provide a comprehensive overview of dietary supplements and their ingredients. This includes presentations on dietary supplement usage patterns in the United States, the regulatory framework on governing supplements, and the importance of scientific investigation in evaluating their efficacy and safety for health promotion and disease prevention. We will cover various topics, um, but we will also have breakout sessions to dive, delve a bit deeper into certain topics, such as dietary assessment methods, research databases, NIH funding opportunities for nutrition and dietary supplements. Um, and then we'll also have uh, stakeholders on the last day on Wednesday discuss dietary supplement quality. So the practicum is named after Mary Frances Picciano, a senior nutrition research scientist who played a significant role in shaping the field of nutrition. The practicum initially was a five-day course um, was held and has been held annually since 2007. It has evolved over time, and this year marks the third year um, where we have done this virtually and been able to open it to a broader audience. So before we begin, um, a few housekeeping details. So the practicum starts each day at 11, um, 11 a.m. Eastern time. Your Zoom link works for all three days. Moderators will uh, provide brief introductions um, to sessions and speakers. Um, but please refer to the agenda and the speaker bios for uh, more information, more detailed information. Technical questions can be submitted in the chat box. Um, and we ask that present, uh, uh, speak, uh, quest sorry, questions that you have present for presenters that you put those in the Q&A tab. We value your participation and we welcome all your questions. So please um, submit as many questions as you want. That really helps to make this more of a success. Um, each speaker's presentation will be followed by a Q&A um, session, and then we also will have some panel discussions, so there's plenty of opportunity to ask questions. Um, lastly, please note that the practicum is being recorded and will be available shortly after this conclusion. We ask that all comments be respectful and relevant to the event topic as outlined in the ODS event guidelines, and the link will be uh, posted in the chat right now. Um, I think we also have posted uh, a link to the agenda and the speaker bio, speaker bios for you. So this figure illustrates the participant count for each practicum since 2007. Um, you can see typically in the beginning, we've had around 90 or more participants each year. The practicum was previously held in person and there were space limitations at NIH. But then in 2021, as I mentioned, we started conducting the practicum virtually. And that's allowed us to really open to a much wider audience. And you can see in 2021, we had 614 unique participants. And in 2022, the number increased to 693 over the course of the three days. And this year, we aim to uh, surpass those numbers. So just to get started, first, I want to provide a brief introduction to the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1994, or DSHEA which established the regulatory framework for the safety and labeling of dietary supplements. This law continues to govern supplement policy today. And then next, I'm going to spend a bit of time giving you an overview of the NIH's Office of Dietary Supplements, um, our mission, and some of the programs we have. So dietary supplements have been used and marketed in various forms for centuries. In 1994, Congress passed the DSHEA, which amended the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. The legislation was necessary as the supplement industry was exponentially growing and a significant percentage at the time of US adults reported taking dietary supplements. So the aim was really to establish consumer standards and explore the potential role of dietary supplements in the US population's diets and health. The DSHEA defined dietary supplements. It established a regulatory framework within the FDA. It established labeling rules 
and it also created the Office of Dietary Supplements specifically at the NIH. So just briefly, labeling guidelines um, require clear identification of a supplement, inclusion of a supplement's facts panel with ingredients, and a disclaimer stating that the product has not been evaluated by the FDA and is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease. So Deshea provided a clear definition for dietary supplements. Before Deshea, there was no regulatory framework for these products. So according to the law, a dietary supplement is a product excluding tobacco that is meant to supplement the diet. It contains one or more dietary ingredients, which can include vitamins, minerals, amino acids, botanicals, and many other different dietary components. Dietary supplements are intended to be taken orally and are available in various forms, um, such as tablets, capsules, liquids, chews, powders. So almost any ingredient in food or product of nature can be turned into a dietary supplement, as long as it's not obviously or likely poisonous, and as long as a manufacturer can find a way to turn the raw material into a finished project, product. So this is just to give you many examples and to really emphasize that we're not just talking about vitamins and minerals, but instead many, many different types of ingredients. So in passing to Shea, the last thing Congress did was mandate the creation of the Office of Dietary Supplements, and it specifically stated that the office had to be placed in the National Institutes of Health. So the ODS mission is to strengthen the knowledge and understanding of dietary supplements, and we do this in several ways. We stimulate and support research to investigate the role of dietary supplements in promoting health and reducing disease risk. We support development of research, research, uh, research tools. We evaluate scientific findings, and we make the most up-to-date scientific knowledge about dietary supplements publicly available. So this slide shows dietary supplement sales from the Nutrition Business Journal, uh, which publishes sales annually. And you can see after Deshea was passed in 1994, there's been quite a steady increase in sales. So you can see from 8.6 billion per year in 1994 to almost 60 billion in 2021 in the US. And then I would also like to point out that in 1994, the, we estimated that there were about 4,000 products on the market, and this has really increased. And we don't have an exact number, but we estimate about 100,000 um, products right now on the market at a given time. So um, the Nutrition Business Journal also provides data on how sales are distributed among vitamins, minerals, herbs, and other types of products. Um, some of these listed here are not dietary supplements from a regulatory purpose, but um, they are used, um, they do consider them in their reporting purposes. So this data is from 2021, but the distribution has basically been pretty stable over the years, um, with the exact percentages changing a bit, but really the distribution staying the same. And you can see that vitamins really lead the pack. These include the multivitamin formulations followed by botanical herbs, and then the specialty products. So the Office of Dietary Supplements has been operating since 1995. We're always guided by a strategic plan, and this is very important because there's a lot of people involved in dietary supplements, from consumers to researchers to regulators to people who develop methodologies of measurements of things in dietary supplements to clinicians. So um, we're currently finalizing our 2022-2026 strategic plan to guide us through the next five years. Our goal sets kind of slightly than I mentioned before is really expanding the knowledge base in a number of different ways. But through all the ways we do it, we always do it in collaboration, um, in collaboration with other institutes at the NIH, other parts of the federal government, private sector and academic sector. So expanding knowledge base, this means expanding the workforce through training and career development by developing research resources. And this is all in the service of translating into useful information for a host of end users, consumers, health professionals, research policymakers, um, good sound data. So new for the 2022-2026 strategic plan is to coordinate and support the development of collaborative initiatives to address gaps in dietary supplement research. 
So in identifying research needs, developing resources, and establishing key partners and communication strategies, ODS takes a multi-pronged approach that is guided by several key questions. Generally speaking, what has driven the office is really what is the public health issue? Are there trends in the use of certain dietary supplements that need to be tracking? Are there safety concerns that need to be considered? Um, are there events that have caused people to use more or less that we can look to in identifying emerging, emerging needs for research? Uh, we've learned a lot about measurement of nutritional status. This applies to a lot of substances in the dietary supplement marketplace that also comes from food. So in terms of foods and dietary supplement sources, it's important to monitor nutritional status and be sure that the measure of those things are reliable. And then what's the evidence for health effect? The very important piece of what we do at ODS, and it's really to make up-to-date evidence-based information publicly available. So we're always looking for ways to fill the gaps in knowledge and translate the results. So we do some of this by co-funding grants with other institutes um, at NIH. Our co-funded grant comprises of 41% of our ODS total extramural investments in fiscal year 2022. Uh, this pie chart reflects types of supplements or ingredients and the amounts we have funded in fiscal year 2022, and it reflects more or less the distribution of the use of these products in the population. Um, but I do want to mention, you know, a very, very small scale. So later today at 3 p.m., we do have a breakout session for those who would like to learn more about the NIH's dietary supplements and nutrition research opportunities. And we have speakers from the NIH's Office of Nutrition Research, as well as from our office. So I just wanted to spend now some time going over some of our programs and, and initiatives. So some of the, the programs we have to achieve our goals. Um, I'm going to um, briefly introduce some of these programs, and then we have speakers from these programs who will provide way more detailed information in their presentations during the practicum. So one important program is the Analytical Methods and Reference Materials Programs, or AMRAM. This program focuses on the accurate and reliable analysis of dietary supplements, which is crucial for demonstrating safety and understanding their health effects. The AMRAM aims is to develop and expand analytical methods, support the development of certified reference materials, support partnerships to emphasize chemical and biological characterization of supplements, and disseminate information and data about validated analytical methods and reference materials. And we have Dr. Adam Kuzak, he leads this program and he'll be presenting tomorrow at 1.30. So um, definitely tune in because this will give you a lot more information about this important program. So in 1999, the Office of Dietary Supplements initiated the Consortium for Advancing Research on Botanical and Other Natural Products Program, or CARBON program, in partnership with the NIH's National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. So the program was established actually in response to a congressional mandate, and it aims to foster collaborative and interdisciplinary research on the safety, effectiveness and mechanisms of action of botanical dietary supplements, specifically ones that may hold significant potential for human health benefits. It also supports the development of methods and resources to facilitate the progress of this research. Dr. Barbara Sorkin directs this program and she will be presenting tomorrow at 2.15. Her presentation will provide further insights into the CARBON program and will specifically focus on the approaches taken to address efficacy, safety, and identity quality aspects in the study of botanicals and plant-derived ingredients. Another program we have is the Population Studies Program, and this program examines the usage of dietary supplements among the U.S. population and specific subgroups, as well as the type, the role of these products, uh, these products in nutritional status. So research within this program focuses on describing usage. Um, this includes specific types of products used, quantities consumed, duration of use. It utilizes data from nationally representative surveys and large population-based studies to investigate emerging issues and changing patterns in supplement use. The program also addresses methodological challenges in assessing supplement use 
um, supplement intake and dietary intake in epidemiological and other large studies. An integral aspect of this program is its funding for vital surveys, such as the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, or NHANES. Um, and this um, survey does collect information on supplement use um, among the US population and has been doing so since 1971. Dr. Cohen will provide further insights in her presentation following mine, specifically discussing NHANES data, and its findings regarding dietary supplement usage, trends, and population character characterization. So the Office of Dietary Supplements has collaborated with others to develop several dietary supplement databases, which serve as a valuable resource for researchers, consumers, and other stakeholders. One notable database is the Dietary Supplement Label Database, or DSLD. It is a publicly accessible database. It provides label information and actual images of dietary supplement labels for products marketed and sold in the United States. Um, the database currently contains over 125,000 labels with 1,000 new labels being added every month. Another very important database is the Dietary Supplement Ingredient Database, or DSID. And this is created by the Methods and Application of Food Composition Laboratory, at the US Department of Agriculture in collaboration with ODS. The DSID offers analytically validated estimates of ingredient content in dietary supplements. So the current versions focus on products such as adult and children multivitamin minerals, non-prescription prenatals, um, omega-3 fatty acids. Additionally, ODS developed the Computer Access to Research on Dietary Supplements, or CARD database. And CARD provides information on federally funded research conducted on dietary supplements since 1999. So um, we also have a session on dietary supplement research databases and resources that's scheduled for tomorrow at 3.15, where you can hear a lot more information on these databases as well as some other ones. So workforce development is also a key objective for the office. Uh, focused on enhancing the research workforce in the field of dietary supplements through training and career development. We achieve this goal through various initiatives. One approach is by utilizing the NIH grant awards to support the extramural community. You will have a chance again to learn more about these opportunities during that breakout session today at 3 p.m. ODS also sponsors intramural scholars awards in collaboration with other NIH institutes and centers. Um, this definitely helps in nurturing talent and fostering career growth. Additionally, we collaborate with other federal agencies to provide support, mentorship, technical guidance to postdoctoral fellows and early career scientists. For instance, we have funded postdocs at institutions such as, such as the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, or NIST, as well as the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And then to further promote workforce development, we offer short-term training opportunities at ODS for students, as well as faculty members. Uh, we've welcomed also several fellows from the American Association for the Advancement of Science, or AAAS fellows. Um, and then lastly, the annual dietary supplement research practicum serves as another plat platform for workforce development in the field. So um, let's see, an essential objective of the, of the office is really, like I said, effectively communicating the science of dietary supplements. Um, and to accomplish this, we have a dedicated and proficient communications team within ODS that really ensures the dissemination of reliable information to the public, researchers, and policymakers. Um, we really encourage everyone to visit our website if you haven't already. Um, it really served as a comprehensive resource resource hub. One exceptional resource available on our website is the collection of dietary supplement fact sheets. These fact sheets cover a wide range of dietary supplement ingredients and supplements marketed for specific purposes, such as weight loss. Currently, we have um, more than 100 fact sheets available, and they're designed for both healthcare professionals and consumers, providing accurate and accessible information. And um, many of them are also translated into Spanish. So in addition to these fact sheets, we have um, we provide e-newsletters 
that are tailored for professional audiences, um, ensuring that healthcare professionals stay up to date with the latest research um, and findings in the field of dietary supplements. Um, we also offer the Scoop, an EU newsletter created specifically for consumers, providing them with important and reliable information regarding dietary supplements. So through these various communication channels and resources, we are dedicated to promoting informed decision-making and understanding um, of dietary supplement, supplements among the public healthcare professionals and other stakeholders. And then I would also like to highlight our ODS evidence-based review program, which plays a crucial role in fulfilling our mission. So in 2001, the Office of Dietary Supplements received a congressional mandate to evaluate um, existing scientific research on the effectiveness and safety of dietary supplements and to identify um, areas that require further research. So to meet this mandate, ODS established um, our evidence-based review program um, it's utilizing the framework of the Evidence-Based Practice Centers program established by ARC. Through this program, systematic reviews of scientific literature are conducted and comprehensive reports summarizing the findings are prepared. Um, and these uh, reviews have really proven to be invaluable. They provide a comprehensive overview of the state of knowledge in specific research areas, highlighting really what is known and what is not yet understood. So through this program, we continue to advance our mission of promoting scientific integrity and evidence-based approaches in the field of dietary supplements. Um, and so we have gained many insights from these reviews and from other um, programs um, that's really revealed the challenges associated with diet, studying dietary supplements. And you'll hear a lot more about these challenges throughout the practicum, but I wanted to highlight a few issues, key issues. And those are, you know, nutrient status, for example. Several studies neglect to account for participants' initial nutrient levels, which can influence the outcome. Lack of generalizability in study populations. So the individuals included in many studies may not represent the broader population, so really limiting their applicability of the findings. Um, un uncertainties regarding timing and duration. Determining the necessary duration of intervention um, to observe results is an ongoing challenge and concern that requires well-formed hypotheses. Difficulty in defining endpoints, issues with dosage comparability. So dose variations across studies really make it difficult to compare results and draw meaningful conclusions. Um, and then there's a host of measurement challenges that impact dietary supplements, um, as well as the health effects being studied. Um, and these will really be covered throughout the practicum. So in summary, these are just a few examples of issues emphasizing the complexities involved in studying dietary supplements. Um, so when it comes to dietary supplements, specifically the product, uh, one challenge really is accurately identifying and characterizing the constituents present in a product. Um, there's also concerns about contamination, including bacteria, the presence of prescription drugs, and then the reproducibility of research findings really depends on addressing these issues as well as others, as well as really ensuring accurate measurement. So tomorrow at 1.30, we do have a session, Rigor and Reproducibility in Dietary Supplement Research, and you'll learn a lot more about these topics. So thank you for your attention. Um, again, to access more information about the office and explore a range of resources on dietary supplements, I encourage you to visit our website. Additionally, if you haven't already, I, re I recommend joining our listserv to receive regular updates and valuable information. And now I'd like to move on to our first session where we will delve into an overview of dietary supplement use in the United States. Um, allow me to introduce Dr. Alexandra Cohn, a postdoctoral research fellow at the Institute for Advancing Health Through Agriculture at Texas A&M University. I've had the pleasure of collaborating with Dr. Cohn for several years during her time as a doctoral student under Dr. Reagan Bailey. And today, Dr. Cohn will be sharing insights on the prevalence of use of dietary supplements in the United States and specific subgroups, as well as shedding light on the characteristics of dietary supplement users. So thank you, Dr. Cohn, um, the stage is yours. Thank you, Dr. Gash. I'll go ahead and share my screen at this Ready. time. So. One second. Okay. Is that looking okay for everyone? Looks great. Okay. 
Great. So thank you, Dr. Gash, for that lovely introduction. Good morning, everyone. Today, I'll be providing an overview of dietary supplement use in the United States. So in today's talk, we will, one, review the major surveys that evaluate dietary supplement use in the United States, two, discuss the methodologies for collecting DS usage information, and three, wrap up with describing the current prevalence of DS use in the U.S. among the general population, as well as specific population subgroups. So with that being said, let's first start with a bit of background on how DS are defined in the U.S. As Dr. Gash noted, in 1994, the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, or DASHA, was enacted by Congress and defined a dietary supplement as any product other than tobacco that is intended to supplement the diet, contains one or more dietary ingredients such as macronutrients, vitamins, minerals, amino acids, herbals or botanicals, or other dietary substances, and it's intended to be taken by mouth. In addition to defining a dietary supplement, DASHA also established the regulatory framework for dietary supplements and created the NIH Office of Dietary Supplements, which is our current host of today's practicum. These dietary supplements defined under DASHA can vary widely in terms of the types of products used and their overall intended use, including micronutrient and macronutrient containing dietary supplements such as multivitamin minerals or MVMs, or omega-3 supplements, as well as herbals and botanicals like St. John's wort and other dietary supplement products such as probiotics and melatonin. As a result, it is extremely difficult to obtain consistency across different manufacturers in terms of the types of products formulated. An MVM is the most common type of dietary supplement consumed but they vary widely and can be formulated as, as you can see here, a multivitamin, multimineral, multivitamin, mineral, or multivitamin, multimineral. There are also many ways to define what a multivitamin is. So you can define them or operationalize them by, for example, counting the number of items in the product or identifying the percent contribution to the daily value of several nutrients. So even with the enactment of DASHA, additional considerations must be made and taken into consideration when identifying types of DS products consumed. So given this wide variety and not only the types of products consumed, but also the differences in formulations across manufacturers, assessing dietary supplement use and nutrients amounts from dietary supplements among the U.S. population can be quite challenging. Uh, our research team, led by Dr. Reagan Bailey, and in collaboration with several ODS researchers, we wrote a critical review identifying the best practices for dietary supplement assessment. And as you can see here, it's on the right, top right-hand corner. Um, but what we determined was that the most commonly used methods for dietary supplement assessment include a wide variety. So diet records, 24-hour dietary recalls, in-home DS product inventories, food frequency questionnaires, short diet history methods, as well as mobile-based applications. And in terms of these dietary assessment tools or dietary supplement assessment tools, um, it's important to note that some of the methods like a DS product inventory focuses solely on assessing dietary supplements exclusively. But some of these other methods like a food frequency questionnaire or a 24-hour dietary recall often measure intakes from dietary supplements in conjunction with measuring intakes from foods and beverages. So that's just one thing to note when selecting a method for assessing intakes from dietary supplements. So three of the most common methods for assessing dietary supplements are 24-hour recalls, food frequency questionnaires, and DS product inventories. These are all widely utilized, as I mentioned, and each have several strengths and weaknesses that are worthy of noting. So very quickly, a 24-hour recall collects rich details on dietary supplement use and are typically less cognitively challenging for participants. 
Um, but there's also a large time and cost burden associated with them, and they're not overly likely to capture more episodically consumed dietary products or dietary supplement products. Um, but that's one method that's really prevalent in the U.S. Food frequency questionnaires are also very common, and they're considered the most cost-effective approach for large-scale research studies. However, they also can pose significant cognitive challenge. They can require literacy when they're self-administered, and they only query on a select number of DS products since it's a questionnaire. And so lastly, a DS product inventory actually has a very high level of accuracy in terms of DS reporting. Um, but this method is very costly, very timely, and very labor intensive, which makes it often not feasible in large scale research settings. Um, so as a result, these are all just caveats that must be taken into consideration, once again, when you're selecting a method for examining dietary supplement use. Nevertheless, despite these considerations and challenges, one common dietary supplement can contribute upwards of 100% of the daily value for over nine different nutrients. So this really just highlights the importance of evaluating nutrient intakes from not only foods and beverages, but also dietary supplements. To give you an example of this, here are four different nutrients that are not only pretty prevalent in the US food supply, but are also common in dietary supplements. If we look at the left-hand side of this figure, we see that for nutrients like magnesium, the majority of intake originates from foods alone. However, for other nutrients like vitamin D, we see a different pattern. So specifically among older adult women, where dietary supplements can contribute about 84% of their total intake. So this really suggests that dietary supplements can play a critical role in meeting nutrient needs for some U.S. population subgroups. So therefore, measuring dietary supplement use is really a very important component of our national surveys. So the two main national surveys that assess dietary supplement use in the U.S. are the National Health Interview Survey, as well as the National Health and Examination Survey, or NHANES. Both of these surveys are large-scale, nationally representative cross-sectional surveys of the non-institutionalized resident U.S. population, but they have slightly different purposes. So, for example, the National Health Interview Survey has been collecting data on the health of the U.S. population since about 1957. Um, so it's been around for quite a bit of time and is a household-based survey that focuses on just a household interview, but it has a much larger nationally representative sample. So it doesn't actually collect dietary data or detailed information on dietary supplements from the product label, but this larger sample and household-based interview focus really allows the survey to increase their scope in terms of the questions asked on dietary supplements and allows for estimates of less commonly used products like herbals and botanicals for the purposes of complementary health practices. So NHANES, on the other hand, really has been collecting data on health and nutritional status of the U.S. population um, continuously since 1999. So the continuous NHANES really is a bit newer than the National Health and, uh, Interview Survey. And it's con conducted in three phases of data collection. So this includes an in-home interview um, and the DS product inventory, which is done in conjunction with that, uh, the health examination in the mobile examination center, uh, which is also included inclusive of a 24-hour dietary call, and lastly, a follow-up interview via telephone. So I'll get into the details of these in the next few slides. However, with NHANES, the main thing to note here is that it really focuses on very detailed information regarding the health and nutritional status of the nation, and it captures rich details on the intakes of dietary supplements via multiple modes of DS assessment. So we're looking at dietary supplement assessment not only via this 
DS product inventory or dietary supplement and prescription medicine questionnaire, but also via the use of 24 hour recalls. And so once again, I'll dig into that a little bit deeper here shortly. Um, but really one thing I wanted to note was that for the purposes of this talk and for the sake of time, we'll be predominantly looking at uh, findings from in population level estimates from the NHANES. Okay, so initially NHANES data did in fact begin collecting data or the NHANES began collecting data more intermittently um, starting in the 1960s. So it has been around a while, but um, NHANES only more recently, beginning in 1999, started collecting continuous data. So meaning that the data is now collected yearly and released in two-year survey cycles. So as you can see here, there's quite a vast quantity of nutritional and health parameters collected under each of the umbrella components of NHANES. Um, so these are all really beyond that of diet and dietary supplements. As I noted earlier, there are three components of NHANES data collection, including the in-home interview, the mobile examination center, and the follow-up interview via telephone. But for DS data, supplement use is collected via those two data collection instruments that I briefly noted. They are one, the DS or dietary supplement and prescription medicine questionnaire or DSMQ, um, which is inclusive of that DS product inventory, as well as two 24 hour dietary recalls. So the dietary supplement and prescription medicine questionnaire, um, along with the demographic data and lifestyle characteristics are collected first during this in-home interview. And so during that time, participants are really asked to report all dietary supplements consumed in the previous date, 30 days, um, and they provide product containers to the interviewer when they're available. So that really allows that rich detail um, collection of dietary supplement information. In addition to that, uh, interviewers will also probe the respondent on their consumption frequency, their doses consumed, and as well as their duration of use of each of the products, um, if they're able to recall that. And then, after that, approximately three weeks later, uh, participants visit what we call the Mobile Examination Center, or MEC, and they complete a self-reported interview or minister 24-hour dietary recall. Um, during this time, they're asked to report all foods, beverages, and dietary supplements consumed from midnight to midnight the previous day. This 24-hour recall is actually administered using what is known as the USDA automated multiple pass method, um, which is a validated gold standard method for dietary recall collection um, and is also designed to encourage accurate recall um, and reduce respondent burden on the participants. And then lastly, we have this follow-up phone interview that is typically conducted approximately three to 10 days after the MEC examination, um, in which interviewers collect a second 24-hour dietary recall via telephone, once again using the USDA AMPM method, and participants, once again, are asked to report rich details regarding all foods, beverages, and dietary supplements consumed in the previous 24 hours. So now let's move on to examining current dietary supplement use in the U.S. population and among population subgroups using NHANES data. When we look at recent NHANES data evaluating trends in dietary supplement use over time among the general population, we see that both overall and micronutrient containing dietary supplement use has increased over the previous decade. So when we look at NEDS use, we see that it increased from 49% in 2007 to 56% in 2018. Um, whereas for micronutrient containing DS use, it increased from 46% to 50% over the same time period. Similarly, when we evaluate trends in the prevalence of overall DS use by age group, 
we see that DS usage patterns remained relatively stable, except for those among younger adults, so those 19 to 30 years of age, as well as older adults, so 70 years and older. Among younger adults, this increase was really from 36% to 41%, um, whereas among older adults, it was from 76% to 83%. For micronutrient-containing DS use, we found that, once again, it was pretty stable from 2007 to 2018, um, except for that older adult population, where we can see it increases from 71% to 78% across the decade. You may also notice here uh, one thing is that we collapsed some of the survey years for this analysis, and that was really just because we wanted to preserve sample size among some of those younger age groups, like those one, two, three years of age. So at the product level, trends in the prevalence of micronutrient-containing and non-micronutrient-containing DS product types among the U.S. population really does tend to vary by the product. Um, for micronutrient-containing product types, MVMs or multivitamin minerals once again remained the most common type of dietary supplement used, but what was interesting is their use actually decreased over time. Um, in addition to that, we also saw decreases in the use of vitamin C and vitamin E products, but observed increases in the use of some single nutrient products like magnesium, vitamin B12, and vitamin D. Whereas for non-micronutrient products or non-micronutrient containing products, I should say, uh, use of the product types was generally low over time, um, but we did see relatively high prevalence of omega-3s in fish oils, herbals and botanicals, as well as joint products. And these for the most part remained relatively stable across the decade. So despite looking at these estimates, for the general U.S. population, we know that dietary supplement use and the most commonly used products does tend to differ by life stage in the U.S. So based off that, in the next series of slides, I'm going to dive a bit deeper into our national data on dietary supplements by life stage and looking at usage patterns across the life course. So let's first start with data on pregnancy and lactation. I'll be pr primarily pulling from a recent paper from our research team that was led by Dr. Shinyang Jun. And as you can see here, the paper primarily focused on evaluating dietary supplement use and characteristics of use among U.S. pregnant and lactating women who participated in the 1999 to 2014 NHANES. Through this analysis, Dr. June and colleagues found that about 70% or more of pregnant and lactating women take at least one dietary supplement on a given day, which is significantly higher than the 45% of non-pregnant, non-lactating women who do so. And if we look at the data more closely, we can see that about 64% of pregnant and 54% of lactating women use a prenatal product, which is pr predominantly a multivitamin mineral. Um, and those are once again defined as having at least three vitamins and at least one mineral uh, for the purposes of our analysis. And looking at the data by trimester, the prevalence of prenatal supplement use was 52% among women in the first trimester. However, this really jumped quite significantly to 80% among those in the second and third trimesters. At the product level, we also saw, in addition to an increase in prenatal use, we saw an increase in iron-containing products um, between the first and the third trimesters. And in the same analysis, we also found that the prevalence of supplement use for overall supplements uh, was significantly higher among older pregnant women, so those 35 to 44 years of age, when compared with younger pregnant women who were 20 to 34 years of age. But we didn't see much of a significant difference with the use of prenatal products. And when looking at the prevalence of use among pregnant women by socioeconomic indicators, we see that both any dietary supplement use and prenatal supplement use increased with increasing family income. 
So this is as measured by categories of the family income to poverty ratio, which is a ratio that is often used to qualify for federal food assistance programs, such as SNAP benefit eligibility. And like with income, both NEDS use and prenatal supplement use also differed by race and Hispanic origin. So non-Hispanic whites were significantly more likely to take a dietary supplement during pregnancy than their non-Hispanic Black or Hispanic counterparts. So moving on to infants and toddlers, once again, we'll be predominantly be discussing findings from an analysis led by Dr. Gash with other ODS colleagues, including Dr. Potishman and Dr. Dwyer titled Dietary Supplement Use Among Infants and Toddlers Less Than 24 Months of Age in the United States. And this analysis was actually using data from the NHANES 2007 to 2014. Um, in general, what this analysis found was that one in five infants and toddlers use at least one dietary supplement on a given day, with the most common products among infants being vitamin D and multivitamin drops, whereas among toddlers, it's actually chewable multivitamin products. And so when we look more granularly across the age groups, we can really see that despite a higher prevalence of overall DS use among toddlers, when compared with their infant counterparts, the you can observe this transition from higher intake of multivitamin and vitamin D drops in the younger age groups to chewable products in this 12 to 23.9 month age range. And so similarly, when we look at trends over time among infants and toddlers, we see that while the prevalence of use of NEDS remained relatively steady from 1999 to 2014, for all infants and toddlers, use actually increased among those younger infants. So those aged zero to 5.9 months over time. So this increase was about 6.5% in 1999 to 2002, and it increased all the way up to 19.5% um, in 2011, 2014, which we think may be partially attributed to an increase in the use of vitamin D, excuse me, products among this population subgroup over time. So next, in addition to infants and toddlers, we'll also be discussing recent data published um, by researchers at the CDC National Center for Health Statistics in collaboration with researchers at ODS, including Dr. Gash and Dr. Potishman, uh, titled Dietary Supplement Use in U.S. Children and Adolescents, 19 years and younger, using data from the most recent cycle of NHANES with dietary supplement data, which is 2017 to 2018. So for children, some of these major findings from this study were that about one third of U.S. children take a DS on a given day, which is pretty consistent with our previous uh, findings with NHANES data. And these are once again, primarily MVM products. Um, but what we also found was that most children typically only take one dietary supplement on a given day. So dietary supplement stacking is not overly common among this population. Um, but the prevalence of use does tend to differ by sex among boys and girls. So girls are significantly more likely to take a dietary supplement than um, boys among U.S. children. So in addition to these differences by sex among U.S. children in terms of DS usage patterns, we also see notable differences by age and race and Hispanic origin. So for example, when we look at the prevalence of DS use by age, we see it was significantly different across all age groups. So the highest prevalence of use by age among U.S. children was actually among those six to 11 years of age followed by the, or sorry, excuse me, two to five years of age, um, as you can see here on the left-hand side of the slide, um, two to five years of age, followed by those six to 11 years of age, then 12 to 19 years of age, and lastly, those two years and younger. Um, for race and Hispanic origin, though, we saw a slightly different pattern 
um, both non-Hispanic white and non-Hispanic Asian children were significantly more likely to take a dietary supplement than their non-Hispanic black and Hispanic counterparts in the U.S. When we look at the prevalence of use by socioeconomic indicators among U.S. children, such as family income and household educational attainment, we see that the prevalence of use increased linearly with both family income and household education. So this really suggests that those with a higher family income or children in a household with higher family income, as well as children in a household with higher educational attainment of a college graduate or above, were significantly more likely to take a dietary supplement than those with a lower family income or lower educational attainment. Nevertheless, at the product level, when we look at the prevalence of DS product types among U.S. children by age group, we see that it does in fact tend to differ um, by age for certain products. So this is kind of similar to what we observed among U.S. infants and toddlers, but we see that in general, most product types by age were pretty low for over, overall prevalence, but also some of the differences that we mostly found and were most notable were really the fact that there were statistically significant differences by group for product types like probiotics, botanicals, single vitamin D products, in addition to this difference in overall uh, MVM use by age. So those are all clearly noted here on the screen. That's helpful. And so when we look at trends in overall micronutrient containing DS use among U.S. children over time, we see that both overall and micronutrient containing use remained relatively stable at about 38 and 35 um, percent, respectively, across the previous decade. So what was interesting here was that the trends in dietary supplement use for both boys and girls paralleled one another over time. This was quite interesting to me because of the fact that we saw with the previous analyses for NHANES 20, 2017 to 2018 that use differed by sex. But when we look at trends over time, um, the trends actually parallel one another. And so for trends in U.S. children, the most notable finding was actually an increase in overall and micronutrient-containing DS use among children living with food insecurity. So uh, food insecure children had an increased prevalence of dietary supplement use from 22% to 31% across the decade um, for overall DS use. And lastly, in a different analysis conducted by our research team and led by Dr. Anita Penjuani, we found that with non-vitamin, non-mineral DS use, it's actually a quite different pattern in terms of trends in use over time. So more specifically, we see that overall non-vitamin, non-mineral use, as well as the use of omega-3s, probiotics, fiber, and melatonin all increased in use from 1999 to 2016. And in addition to the analysis on U.S. children, Mishra and colleagues at the CDC National Center for Health Statistics, in collaboration with ODS researchers, also investigated dietary supplement use among U.S. adults who participated in the 2017-2018 NHANES and found that nearly 60% of U.S. adults take a dietary supplement, once again a common MVM product, and DS use is typically higher among U.S. women when compared with men. However, unlike U.S. children, over 20% of U.S. adults report taking three or more dietary supplements on a given day, which, as I briefly noted, this is commonly referred to as DS stacking. So despite MVMs being the predominant product type used among U.S. adults, um, as with most other age groups, uh, we see that vitamin D, omega-3, vitamin C, and botanical products are all also pretty common. Um, in terms of demographic and socioeconomic characteristics, 
DS use also tends to increase with age among U.S. adults, uh, regardless of the product type used. And based on our previous work, we know that DS use is often more common um, among those with a higher family income, those who are food secure, and those who are income ineligible for participating in SNAP regardless of their population subgroup among U.S. adults. Additionally, when we look at trends in the prevalence of overall and micronutrient-containing use over time by population subgroup, we see increases in use among a number of subgroups. So, for example, overall DS use increased among both men and women from 48 to 55 percent and 60 to 66 percent, respectively. And when looking at DS use by race and Hispanic origin, family income, and food security status, Increases in overall and micronutrient containing DS use were observed for non Hispanic, Black, and Hispanic adults, adults with a low income, and adults living with both food insecurity and food security. And in the same analysis, we also found consistent results with previous findings that suggest overall DS use differs by sex, race, and Hispanic origin, and family income. Um, but was Different, what was different with this analysis was that actually, as you can see here, we found that micronutrient containing DS usage patterns also tend to parallel those of overall DS use in the adult population. So once again, usage patterns are typically higher among women, non-Hispanic white adults, and those with a higher family income. Nevertheless, in addition to a high prevalence of MVM and vitamin D products among U.S. adults, omega-3s, a non-vitamin, non-mineral product, was also commonly used at approximately 26%. And to wrap up, the last life stage we're going to touch on briefly is U.S. older adults. Analysis led by Dr. Gash and her colleagues at ODS investigated dietary supplement use among U.S. older adults who participated in the 2011 to 2014 NHANES. Through this analysis, they determined that about 70% of U.S. adults reported taking at least one dietary supplement on a given day, or in prior 30 days, excuse me, with similar DS usage patterns as the general U.S. adult population, but once again with this higher prevalence of DS stacking. And when examining characteristics of the population subgroup more closely, we see that DS use is not only more common about among older adult women, but also among this oldest of old women population. Um, and DS use was actually more common or DS were more likely, or sorry, women were more likely to use a DS nearly twice as often as older men in this older adult population. And like with the general U.S. adult population, NEDS and MVM use differed by race and Hispanic origin, with NEDS use significantly lower among Hispanics when compared with their non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic Black, and non-Hispanic Asian counterparts. And for family income, both NEDS use and MVM use increased linearly with family income level among this population. And lastly, when looking at the prevalence of use among older adults at the product level, we see that the most commonly reported products among this older adult population are MVMs, followed by vitamin D and, cal and then calcium and vitamin D, vitamin C products. Um, and all of these were really regardless of sex, but there were some significant differences in the prevalence of use of certain products. Um, like MVM and B complexes and vitamin D products between men and women. Um, for non vitamin, non mineral products, once again, it was really omega 3s and botanicals. So I know that was a whirlwind and a lot of information. Um, sorry, I was really trying to just get in as much as we could in that time period. But to summarize, we see that about 77 and 70% 70 of pregnant and lactating women use a dietary supplement on average. Um, and this is predominantly a prenatal product. For infants, we see that in toddlers, we see that about one in five infants and toddlers use a dietary supplement with vitamin D and multivitamin drops 
most common among the infant population, and chewable multivitamins most common during toddlerhood. For children, it's about one third of children using a supplement on a regular basis, with MVMs being the most frequently consumed. But children's what, what is different than the adult population is that they really only typically take one dietary supplement on a given day, and their use is more prevalent but among non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic Asian, and higher income children. For adults, we see that nearly 60% of them take a dietary supplement, predominantly MVMs, on a given day. Um, about 35% take more than one TS on a given day, and supplement use also increases with family income and differs by race and Hispanic origin. Lastly, the older adult population is really about 70% of users, um, with about one third of users reporting four or more products. So really high prevalent use of uh, DS stacking in that population with vitamin D and multivitamin mineral products being most common. So two last things to note are that self-reported dietary assessment methods are prone to measurement error, but not only that, we really don't know very much about the measurement error structure of DS reporting at present. So those are just some things to take into consideration whenever you're evaluating uh, self-reported dietary intake. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for listening, thank all of our collaborators and researchers who have contributed to this work, and I'm willing to take any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. Um, we do have some um, questions here. Um, so a few of them have been asked, answered in the chat already, um, but we do have a question here, I see. Is the um, healthy eating index for dietary supplement users higher than non-users? Um, that is a good question. So it's actually interesting because the healthy eating index is obviously based off of foods and beverages alone, um, but there is typically a healthy user effect with dietary supplement users. I haven't looked at that very closely, to be quite honest, um, but I would anticipate that it would generally be higher because of this healthy user effect. So um, dietary supplement users are typically more likely to be more health conscious, to be non-smokers, um, to be generally interested in their overall health. So we do know that with dietary supplements, um, nutrient intakes are generally higher than those from uh, among DS users in comparison to non-users. But yeah, the healthy eating index is kind of an interesting avenue to look at in regards to supplement use. Um, but yeah, hopefully thank that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Um, we had a question, I answered it, but maybe we just wanna reiterate it, that um, is NHANES able to provide um, information on intake at a regional level in a state? I had answered no, but maybe you just want to explain um, the sampling design of NHANES. Yeah, so NHANES uses a complex multi-stage sampling cluster design. So it is intended to be nationally represented. Nap wow, I can, sorry. Nationally representative when using the NHANES survey weight. So if you're not using a weighted analysis when using NHANES data, it is more considered a convenient sample. Um, however, when using the survey weights, which is the recommendation from the National Center for Health Statistics, um, it is considered nationally representative of the entire U.S. population. So as Dr. Gash noted, um, it's not typically or really cannot be used to look at regional differences. Exactly. Thank you. Um, let's see here. We do have another question. Um, I think this one I could answer too, but do herbal <laughs> supplements for kids need any scientific support to be sold in the United States? And I would just answer that um, no, not they don't have any special um, support needed other than the regular regulation yeah. of dietary supplements. Yes, and dietary supplements are not typically regulated by the FDA. So that is different than foods and beverages. Right, and you'll learn more about that 
in our next session um, where we have a speaker from FDA. Um, she'll discuss more about how the FDA regulates supplements. And again, it's a lot more like foods than drugs. So you, it doesn't require pre-market approval, um, drugs do. And so, um, but then the FDA does have ways to um, monitor adverse events and yeah. can take action um, in those cases. Okay, let's see. Um, oh, this one's hard. So of course, uh, Julie Carlson noted, bioavailability matters, and that's exactly right. Um, how is data collected on this detail? That should be most likely um, affected by dose. Um, you can take this, Alexandra, but the short answer is we don't have information on this. Yeah. Unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, so that's actually something that we touched on in our critical review, um, looking at the best practices for dietary supplement assessment, that is that the, compared to foods and beverages, Dietary supplements really are a black box to the research community. We do not understand how bioavailability um, differs between nutrient intakes from dietary supplements versus those from foods and beverages, but we do know that they were likely to differ. Um, there just is a great need for a lot more research in this area. Um, so we're just chipping away at it as we can. Yes, and I would add, though, um, we have looked at, through NHANES, um, certain intake of specifically folic acid yeah. or vitamin D and then nutritional status. And we do see that um, users of these specific um, products are less likely to be deficient. So there is some indication that, yes, it's being absorbed um, but on a population level, no, we don't have very detailed information on that using NHANES. That's great. Okay. There was a related question to that previously that was asking about how do consumers then know what they're consuming if they are not sure about what is written on the label? Could either of you answer that? Yes. So this um, is complex. Um, definitely session, our last session of the day on Wednesday, we'll cover a lot more of this, the diet quality, uh, dietary supplement quality session. We will have someone from third party verifiers, so the USP, they will discuss sort of how they go about, um, you know, helping to ensure that uh, what consumers um, are buying is what they're actually getting. Um, but this is very complicated. Um, so I think the short answer from us is, uh, with third-party verifiers, um, a consumer can have some indication that hopefully what they're um, what's what it says on the label is what they're actually consuming because they have to um, follow certain guidelines and standards when they're part of these third-party verification organizations. So that's one thing, but you'll hear a lot more about that at that session on Wednesday afternoon. Okay, so let's see. We have another question. Um, we have, what is the difference between nutri nutritional facts and supplement facts? Although both have macronutrients, micronutrients, and others in the, uh, in the product. There's quite a large difference between the nutrition facts panel and a supplement facts panel. Um, it's actually interesting if you look at them side by side, um, but the supplement facts panel really focuses on the percent daily value um, from nutrients. And I think I had an example of that supplement facts panel on um, one of the early slides that we had. One second, let me go back to it. I don't know if it's helpful for me to share the screen. Um, sure. Okay, I'll go ahead and do that. One second, let me find it. Um, Here it is. Just share screen. So as you can see here, it's really focused on this percent daily value and the amount per serving. And then they also include um, the serving size. So for example, for this product, it was one tablet. And this is just a very common product used in the marketplace. Um, the nutrition facts panel is going to be a lot different uh, 
they still have a percent daily value, but it will include more macronutrients and then information um, like tra trans fats versus saturated fats versus uh, unsaturated fats and things like that. So hopefully this is helpful to look at. Um, but yeah, obviously here we're focused a bit more on the supplement effect panel. And related to this, uh, Alexander, there was a slide where you were talking about supplements providing 100% or more of daily values, remember? Mm -hmm. There was a question about that. Do supplements uh, have tolerable upper limits? Um, supplements alone do not have tolerable upper limits, but nutrients included in supplements have tolerable upper limits. And we do see that among dietary supplement users, they are significantly more likely to exceed the tolerable upper intake level for um, a few select nutrients in comparison to non-users. Um, so that's why it's really important to evaluate nutrient intakes from not only foods and beverages, but also dietary supplements, because without taking those intakes into consideration, um, you're not only at risk for underestimating um, the proportion at risk for excessive intake, but you're also um, potentially likely to overestimate the proportion at risk for nutrient inadequacy. So um, yeah, <laughs> it's really important for those reasons to not only evaluate in intakes from foods and beverages, but also dietary. Thank you. Um, no we have another question, um, and we kind of have a couple of questions about this, but does NHANES ask questions regarding prescription drug use um, from their participants so that you could use this data in combination with the dietary supplement data? Um, a lot of people are interested in herb drug interaction data. Okay, very interesting. Um, they ask, they do ask a few questions on prescription medications. So they will add, and then they will also ask if um, the dietary supplement was recommended by a healthcare provider. So that's some interesting ways to look at um, NHANES data and, and dietary supplements versus prescription medications. Dr. Oh. Gash, do you have any? Yeah, so you, to mean add? you mean that they're also including the prescription supplements in this file? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is about um, just dr general prescription drugs. And I will add that NHANES does collect this detailed information. So it is possible it's to look at these interactions. But again, um, it can be difficult if you're looking at rarer supplements or rarer drugs, because um, you might not have the sample size, but more commonly used uh, products and drugs. You could definitely look at this, especially if you combine um, many years of NHANES data because then you should have the sample size. Yeah. And Jamie, can you comment about any databases that exist for interactions, drug nutrient interactions, the drug yeah, supplement interactions? You. There are a couple. Um, there's none that ODS specifically has developed, but there are a couple, and we'll post those in the Q&A. We'll post links to those in just a few minutes. Okay, um, let's see. Um, okay, so there is a question. Um, is there any data on antioxidant proliferation? Um, not exactly sure what that is, but um, I know for NHANES, definitely not. Yeah, <laughs> um, actually, yeah, anti antioxidants can be challenging to look at in measure um, with NHANES in terms of dietary supplements, um, just because of different conversion factors and things like that. Um, so not at present. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I think that wraps it up. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Cohen. Um, great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have our next speaker, Dr. Johanna Dwyer. She's a senior nutrition scientist in the Office of Dietary Supplements. She's also the director of the Francis Stern Nutrition Center at the Tufts Medical Center. She's a professor of medicine and community health at Tufts University School of Medicine, also at the Friedman School of Nutrition, Science and Policy at Tufts. 
um, as well as a senior scientist at the Jean Mayer U.S. Department of Agriculture Human Nutrition Research Center on age, um, Aging at Tufts. So please welcome Dr. Dwyer, and she's going to tell us all about why Americans are using dietary supplements. Thanks, Jamie, and thank you. Alex gave a great talk. It was wonderful. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Great. Okay, we're going to talk about motivations here. First of all, whether they matter. Secondly a little bit more on collecting motivations, information, then a little bit about reasons for supplement use that differ between people and supplement types, and finally some insights. So let's get started with um, motivations. I think they really do matter for dietary supplements. First of all, because alerts, they give you an alert about inappropriate use. Say a person who's using a supplement to treat a disease when there's a better, more effective treatment that's out there. You want to know that if you're a clinician and to give them um, <clears throat> advice and listen to what they're, uh, what they're doing. And, and secondly, uh, Alex has already pointed out <clears throat> some of the problems with respect to um, dis discouraging use. If we know there's a harmful drug interaction, for example, we'd want to know about that. And Secondly, we sometimes want to encourage use, for example, with prenatals. Again, uh, Alex has shown that most people use prenatals, but not everybody. Here's one example uh, that might be uh, germane here. Years ago, I did a study here in Boston on uh, exclusively breastfed infants. These people tended to be um, macrobiotic vegetarians. This was many years ago. And we, we found a lot of the uh, women had problems, their infants had problems with um, vitamin D status. So this study uh, was not done by me, it was done by other people, but looking at, at the problem of women who were breastfeeding their infants, they weren't vegetarians, they were generally uh, just uh, uh, omnivores, who were breastfeeding their infants exclusively with nothing else, just, just the, uh, the breast for over four to six months. And many of them didn't give uh, vitamin D supplements, although the Academy of Pediatrics and other groups suggest that that's needed after six months because breastfeeding alone is not going to be enough. Uh, motivations helped in this uh, particular instance because uh, they helped the providers to address the reasons why people weren't doing it. And mothers weren't giving D for a lot of different reasons. One, some people assume that the breast milk had enough when it does under four months, but and then afterward, not uh, not so much as the infant is growing. Um, they fed a little bit of formula now and then, and they thought that this would have enough in it to get the infant through. Uh, some people thought the baby disliked the supplement, and then there were others who just didn't know the supplement was needed. Each of those motivations would require a different uh, set of guidance and help from the provider, so you can see how it could be important. Let's go on and talk a little bit about some of the methods for studying um, how you get at motivations. And Alex has talked a lot about sales and surveys, and I'll talk a little bit more about specifics, focus groups, uh, and then some of the uses label databases and the web may be put to to get at motivations. Let's start with supplement sales and volume. This assumes that motivations are reflected in, in sales volume or prices. And it does give you an idea if you look at what people are taking, uh, what they're willing to pay for at least. But, but it's not a very good proxy for motivations. It certainly doesn't re reflect presence of use as Alex has already pointed out. It doesn't give very much information about motivations either. Some of the condition specific supplements like bone health, joint health, mental health, um, are, are revealing at least uh, of what you would assume people would be taking them for. They're also very expensive, so they, they distort any estimates of prevalence. And, but some of the popular supplements, if you're looking for motivations, like generic multivitamin mineral supplements, really uh, don't have a label that says take them for this. They're cheap and they distort, again, um, estimates of prevalence. 
So motivations inferred from these kinds of data are really not very uh, good. What's much better are surveys, and they're the federal surveys that Alex has talked about, as well as commercial surveys and some of the smaller surveys of special groups. And let me just go through each of them. Alex has done a great job on the Haynes, so we won't need to talk too much about that, except to say that the wonderful thing about Haynes was uh, several years ago, they, they asked directly about motivations. So you get an idea of what people really told the investigators about what was going on. Uh, the problem right now with Haynes, as you probably know, the COVID years really took a, a toll on all of the national surveys, especially Haynes. And um, the response rates have been rather low in the past couple of years. Also, you have to always remember it's cross-sectional. So you get a motivation at one time, but it may not be the motivation at the next time the person takes it. And there's very little data on some of the less commonly used uh, supplements because so many of the supplements used in the national survey are uh, micronutrient supplements. Nevertheless, there's a lot there and we'll show you some data from there later. And then the other one she mentioned was the NHIS. It's population-based, it's very large. When you try to go to motivations, it's not so good. Uh, what you have here is broad categories of supplements like single uh, multivitamins and so forth. Um, what's valuable is those, those four years or th three or four years when they did special surveys in 2002, 2007, and 2012, they did a, an additional questionnaire that got at um, supplement use, but it also got at complementary and alternative medicine use. So for people who are using these kinds of um, uh, uh, treatments as well, you get very, very detailed information. The problem with all of this now, of course, is it's 10 years old. Um, and there are very few product details and no links to health measures or health outcomes, but nevertheless, very valuable, well look, worth taking a look at. The commercial surveys, there's several of them out there. Natural Marketing Institute is probably the best known one. Occasionally, the Pew and uh, Nielsen and some of the other big survey companies uh, do surveys and include things about dietary supplements. The pros about these commercial sur surveys is there, there's some lim limited trend data available, at least from the NMI surveys and uh, motivations are included in that. Uh, the turnover is very rapid. Usually it's only a couple of months. So you submit your item uh, to include on the survey and it goes out and then you get the results very quickly. The problem is you have to pay for that. Uh, you have to pay to play. It's not public use. The data are uh, uh, copyright protected. In some cases, the items and questionnaires, hopefully not the ones that you put in, are not very well worded. They're ambiguous and it's hard to make much out of them. But in general, it's very useful information. The problem is it's not connected with health outcomes the way Haynes is or health status. Uh, and there, there's some reason to think it. they may oversample users. And for people who are web illiterate, since most of them now are being done uh, over the web, it's very difficult to get at groups like, for example, the very old uh, or people who don't speak English unless they do a special uh, survey in other languages. Um, the third group I'd like to talk about are those special surveys of prescribers, people like doctors or coaches or salespeople and health food stores and users, whether they're war fighters or cancer survivors or HIV patients. And these, these surveys of special groups are extremely useful because they explain the behavior of subgroups that, that are at special risk often. And they're very useful for crafting interventions. For example, People, if you want to do a survey and find uh, that risky dietary supplements are harmless, there is a group of people who feel it. And they're taking things like colloidal silver. Uh, the cons are that 
items may be poor, poorly worded. A lot of these surveys are done by people who don't do surveys every day. They're interested in uh, dietary supplements or they're interested in dietitians or coaches or whatever. And so they, they tend to make up their own survey items. And those items are often not tested very well for meaning. So it's hard if the respondents may not be responding to what you want them to. And so what I'd suggest for those who in the audience who are planning their own surveys, use the items that have already been used in the National Health Interview Survey or the NHANES. Those are public use. You can just take them down from the web and use them exactly as, as they're written. I, those items have all been co cognitive tested in focus groups and, and we know that they get at the meaning uh, of the question. Um, the other problems with these special surveys is always look to see what, how, what the response rate is because very often they're very low um, and low response rates can be a problem if you're trying to say all coaches, all dietitians, all uh, physicians are doing a certain thing or they're motivated a certain way. So those are the, the, the direct sorts of things. Let me show you one example of how these can be useful. This was a study that was done in Ireland. I think it was done in the early 2000s when the Irish food supply was unfortified with folic acid. Intakes were quite low and the prevalence of neural tube defects was quite high. So they did a, they did a public health campaign in, in around 05 and got very, very good um, uh, adherence to taking folic acid during pregnancy. 96% of pregnant women were taking it. Uh, however, only about 25% took dietary supplements for that, uh, that three or four month period prior to conception. And because we know that it's the neural tube closes in the first couple of weeks of pregnancy, if you're taking folic acid only after you go to the doctor, say in the second month of pregnancy, it's not gonna do much good in terms of neural, neural tube defect. So the survey was helpful in that it showed that uh, this was the problem and, and they went on and got motivations. And some of the women weren't expecting to get pregnant and that was the reason why they weren't taking the preconceptional folic acid. And others were unaware of the risks, either they were poor, or non-English speaking immigrants. Each of those things, again, has a different sort of intervention that you'd use if you were in this situation to get a preconceptional use of these uh, supplements. So you see how th those surveys can be very useful in terms of public health. Now, just back to the focus group and cognitive interviews, I mentioned that the National Center for Health Statistics has for many years used um, focus groups to get at, at thinking and logic behind um, supplement use. And they've done a lot of surveys over the years uh, using the data that they've obtained from this. And so there I urge you again to use the items that they've, they've used uh, in the national surveys. If you're going to do your own focus groups, first of all, remember it's gonna take a lot of time they're very costly to do because you've got to attend the focus groups, then replay and analyze the data. You need to make sure to hire a well-trained interview who doesn't lead the respondents. And you need to also be sure that the person who's interpreting the data, because it is qualitative and subjective, it's best done by, uh, I think, uh, professionals who are trained in doing this. Nevertheless, very valuable information. Now, let me go on to a couple of newer ways of getting at least sort of sideways at motivations. And one of them is a label database. As I mentioned, I, I think uh, Jamie mentioned the dietary supplement label database. We have a huge database that has icons of all of the supplements. It has a picture of the supplement label and it has uh, all of the information that's on the label, including all of the marketing claims that are on there. And I think you can do a fair amount of uh, infer inference of the motivations for possible use by the product marketing claims. In other words, if a, if a supplement says it's for joint health, you'd assume that the people would be taking, taking uh, the supplement for joint health. 
Now, granted, it's only an inference. And some labels, unfortunately, actually, we're up to 170,000 now, Jamie. We've, we've done a lot of work over the past couple of months. Very uh, some labels are still not in there. We, we thought 10 years ago that when we hit 100,000, we'd have all the labels in the, in the country. Well, we still don't, and we're up around 170,000. And some labels uh, don't really hint. They don't say for bone health or joint health or mental health or what have you. Uh, so you don't, you really can't tell who the potential user is. But for some of them, you have a pretty good idea. The other use of the internet is using search engines. And I've played around about this uh, with some of uh, my students at Tufts, uh, entering possible motivations and seeing what comes up on a search engine. And we think we can infer the motivations of what people are doing when they type something into a search engine uh, from the kinds of products that come up. Uh, let me show you in a minute what I mean by this. Again, I, I admit all of this is only inference that you can make about motivations. This takes a lot of time to do. So if you're gonna do it, don't do it yourself. If you have graduate students, get one of them to do it. They're much better at it than I am. You go down all sorts of rabbit holes on the internet and some searches uh, really don't hint at potential use, but some interesting things came up. What we did was we did, we typed searches into Google and we took a look at, we. We took motivations that we thought that people might, might have to see what came up on the internet. Let me show you. Um, this is, <laughs> we, we, we were instigated in doing this because I read this article about a study that showed that the major consultant for a lot of cancer patients was Google, which isn't good. And now, before I go into this, remember that uh, the law says that you can't, you can't say on a label that, that a supplement product diagnosis prevents, treats, or cures disease. You can say it's illegal to say these things, as I understand it. Our FDA colleagues will speak later about it. What you can say is a structure function claim that helps maintain, supports health, or so forth. So you can say immune system health, not immunodeficiency, for example. Come on. There we go. Um, okay, so what we did was we typed in uh, searches on supplements and cancer. And what we came up with was results pages on Google. If you've ever typed in, you know, they, they comes up with a whole bunch of things, some from the National Cancer Institute, some from less uh, authoritative sources, shall we say, uh, which are content. They're things you can read. But what also comes up is about 100, uh, 500 ads. So for 160 content pages, we found 496 ads when we typed these kinds of things in. Here's what we typed in. Search, search term was supplements and cancer. I'll look at all the ads. If you type in supplements to prevent cancer, again, a whole bunch of ads with supplements, because this is how Google makes money, supplements to treat cancer, supplements to support cancer treatment, when we typed in supplements to cure cancer, nothing came up. And the reason for that is I think uh, the advertisers are smart enough to recognize that they put that in, uh, the feds will be on to them. Uh, the other thing we found though was, was these uh, 160 content pages. And we rated those pages on how non-commercial they were. In other words, how authoritative they were and how non-commercial they were. Were they trying to sell something or were they really trying to give advice? And the answer was that only about 25% of them were high in quality. And unfortunately, the, the good pages, the pages from the Mayo Clinics, the cancer centers uh, sponsored by NIH, all of those things didn't come up first in the search. They weren't easy to see. There was this mix of advertising and uh, clinics that were pretty shady rather than what we would have liked to see. So uh, I think that can be helpful and, and we certainly don't want anybody to confuse a Google search with a doctor. Okay, well, let me, um, I digress. Let me go on and just uh, finish up this talk and see if I can get you some virtual lunch um, with motivations that differ by supplement types and users. And 
Alex uh, pointed to this. Uh, this is also nice because uh, remember, Alex talked a lot about Haynes, and this is another paper from the Haynes work that uh, Reagan Bailey and, and many of the other people in the Office of Dietary Supplement did. And what you see here is if you look at supplement the diet, which is what the law says supplements are for, it was a fair number of reasons people took these supplements. But for most of the supplements, they were taken for a lot of other reasons as well. And I should point out that this is all driven by that huge proportion of the population of supplement users that use supplements, uh, multivitamin, mineral, and other micronutrient and macronutrient supplements. Uh, but there are some other, and if you look at the most frequently uh, reported motivations for using supplements, which was improving overall health, you see that multivites were used a huge amount of the time, and so were the single vitamins and minerals, and also some macronutrients and the protein ones. And botanicals even were used uh, to improve over overall health, but it, it varies from one supplement to another, what the motivation is. So it wasn't only to supplement the diet or what the law says, but also many other reasons to stay healthy, prevent and treat disease. And that brings me to this whole area of um, condition-specific supplements. They're easy to use, they're, they're cheap, or not terribly inexpensive, but uh, compared to some other treatments probably. Uh, they're seen as harmless by many people and possibly effective additions. In other words, many people use them. They go to the doctor, they get whatever the pills are that they're supposed to be taking for their or treatment for their uh, condition. And then they add this on or stack as, as Alex called it, this other treatment. Sometimes it's because people lack money for traditional treatment and they use them instead or they try the alternative because uh, they didn't have good luck with the traditional treatment. They're just despairing because they've tried everything and it doesn't work, or they prefer self-treatment or they believe product marketing. It says condition specific, so it must work. Um, let me just show you some motivations. These are for nutrient supplements. Uh, if you look at the purple, which is immune health and colds, people are, tend to take vitamin C for that. This is again, Haynes data. Uh, for bowel health, which is the green, you see the fiber uh, is the motivation. Uh, the, the, bowel, the bowel health is motivation, they're taking fiber. For heart health, it's niacin and omega-3s. I don't think that's a surprise And fish oil. And then for bone health, it's uh, vitamin D and calcium. The problem is efficacy, is another matter, particularly when you get into the botanicals and the reason taking botanicals. But you remember during COVID, it was such a desperate situation in early 2020 when we didn't know what to do. It's not a surprise that uh, I think there was a COVID despair effect and people just turned to anything they could to try to prevent um, or treat this strange virus. Now with the non-nutrient supplements, motivations may be different. And I think Alex pointed out that this is something that we, have, we don't have much information on. We do have a little, this is old data now, it's 10 years old, but we, we knew in those days that about 18% of US adults used a non-vitamin, non-mineral supplements. This is NHIS data. And most of them use it for a wellness reason. Virtually all of them used it in the blue, if you look on your left. Uh, but then there were others who were also using it. Well, at the same time, people were also using it to treat a health uh, condition or disease. And so these, these, um, these may be used for, for other purposes. And here, if you look at this, uh, these data uh, uh, about cancer patients, you see that cancer patients are much more likely to be using um, dietary supplements than people who are uh, free of that particular disease. And that's been true for many years. 
And as uh, supplement use increases, of course, it could increase as well. One other example uh, or two on groups and how they have different motivations and, and, and types of supplements that they're using. Going back to older adults, just for a minute, um, people with older, uh, with, with chronic disease, and particularly older people, because they're the ones who have the most chronic disease, use more condition-specific supplements than their healthier peers. And here's an example from Haynes of glucosamine and chondroitin use, which is used for joint health. If you have a history of arthritis or osteoarthritis, you're much more likely to use glucosamine and chondroitin than those who are not. And if you have a history of a hip fracture or osteoporosis, you're much more likely to use calcium, which is in the red, or vitamin D, which is in blue. So people with chronic disease uh, are likely to use condition-specific supplements much more than their healthier peers. Uh, now, Alex mentioned stacking of supplements. But the problem with older people, and here's, here's some data from one of the most recent Haynes's on stacking or uh, just supplements and that business of stacking or using four or more, about 25%, three, 11%, and two, four, 17%. I think that's in the very oldest category in Haynes. The problem here is that um, not only are they using multiple supplements, but they're also using they're stacking a lot of OTC over-the-counter drugs and also prescription drugs. So this is a, if you think about it, it's a situation that's ripe for drug nutrient interactions and drug-drug interaction, drug supplement interactions. So we need to be very careful, particularly in that group of the old uh, in, in worrying about that and giving good advice. Um, the other group that's very high in their use of all sorts of dietary supplements are uh, war fighters. And the people at the Department of Defense have done some wonderful work in, in protecting supplement uh, use in, in, in soldiers by providing good advice so that they make wise choices. But here's some data from just one of their studies a few years ago you see that the prevalence of use, even back in the um, mid-16s, was up around um, 80, 80%, 70 to 80%. And you see also that when the soldiers were out of uh, garrison and in, deployed in a, in a battlefield situation, they used even more supplements than they did at home. And I know Andrea Lindsay and her colleagues will be talking later about some of the more recent studies. And it really is um, a big problem. And so the military is a high risk uh, use because uh, a, high, a high use group. And they also are using some supplements in some cases that are risky. And so we need to be very careful about giving them good advice. Uh, now, there are many sources of motivation here, and I won't go into detail, but just mentioning authority and role models of various sorts. People who are, have a lot of social influence over folks tend to be motivators. Uh, some people are motivated themselves because of their efforts for self-improvement or their worldview, part of a whole lifestyle, if you will. And then some people are motivated because they see ads or marketing. And just to, to wind up, one of the problems with this is who do you really regard as an authority? I think most of us in this, in this group probably regard a doctor or some health authority when it comes to supplement, but other people think of a lot of other people like coaches or trainers. And then of course, we have to always ask what kind of evidence is being uh, used as the basis for what authorities say. It's not only the U.S. Preventive Health Services Task Force that people are using. They're also using some things that we wish they weren't. Um, in terms of advertising and marketing, we have to remember that commercial speech's goal is to sell or persuade consumers. And so this 
noticing, understanding, concluding, retaining belief, and then buying the supplement is what a lot of the ads are for. Well, the implications of all of this in terms of takeaways. First of all, motivations can certainly reveal health problems as well as some misunderstandings. And that's why as healthcare providers, we want to be, we want to know what people are doing. We've got some methods to find out. And the motivations we know are going to vary enormously from user to user and from one supplement to another. And then the final plea I would have is to ask about them. If you're, you're seeing patients, be sure to take a little extra time to talk with patients who have many chronic illnesses, particularly those with poor prognoses, advanced stages, many meds, painful, complicated, or ineffective conventional therapies that just aren't working. And also those who are using supplements in possibly risky patterns, whether it's polypharmacy and stacking of the supplements and also these other medications um, and or using supplements to delay or replace effective medical treatment. So if you don't ask, they're not going to tell you. If you look at these data from NHIS a couple of years ago now, you see that in many, many cases, the physician forgot to ask. Uh, I can understand why, because they're seeing so many patients at 15 minute intervals usually. They don't have time to ask, but if you don't ask, they're not going to tell you. And so you're going to miss some of these interactions, I think, that can be easily prevented. So please uh, ask your patients if uh, they're taking supplements and jot down the ones that are particularly risky. Thank you so much for uh, listening, and I hope you uh, have a, a good lunch uh, after we get through the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dwyer. Um, we have some Thanks, questions Steve. here. Um, if we'd like to get started, uh, we have a question here uh, regarding synthetic folic acid specifically. What is being done to clarify the potential lack of bioavailability increased health risk? Um, and then because of the additional step, step in the folate cycle, making it less bioavailable, it may result in elevated unmetabolized folic acid. Yes, well, uh, I think we'll hear later in greater depth um, from others who are even more knowledgeable on this, but basically uh, we're not sure. Sometimes the, the unmetabolized folic acid may be uh, just excess. It's not that it wasn't metabolized. It's just that enough has been metabolized. In terms of looking at folic acid, we're monitoring that very closely in terms of intakes of folic acid and also metabolism. And uh, actually, uh, some studies are on the, uh, on the drawing board right now with respect to those uh, specific things. Thank you. OK. We have another question. Is there a difference in infants getting vitamin D if born in a hospital versus at a birthing center or at a private residence? Hospitals seem to start D as the standard care in newborns. I don't think we have information on this. Is that right? Yeah, I don't think we do either. Uh, it's a good question. Um, I, I don't know the answer, and it's, it, it's a good thing to study. Okay, thank you. Um, is there any way of tying the ODS DSLD with companies that submit their structure function claims for products with the FDA? Uh, is there a way, I guess, the person's asking of making these websites more robust and user friendly? Yes, that, yes, uh, I agree 100% with the person who says any way we can make them more robust and user friendly is, is what we're after. Uh, the the DSLD is not a regulatory database. It's basically a research database and a database that faces out to the consumer to try to help them see what's in the supplements that they're um, uh, taking. Um, in terms of interacting between databases, and it's not only FDA uh, databases and claims and things like that, but also even more important, the USDA databases and the wonderful uh, uh, databases they have over there on food, 
uh, we've been working now for a couple of years with experts at the NIH and elsewhere to try to integrate those more thoroughly. What's helping a lot is the new uh, software, uh, which, which makes it much easier to do, but I don't think we're still there yet, but a very good question. Okay, thank you. We have another question. Is inflammation considered a disease claim, meaning um, specifically the normal inflammation that increases with age? Um, I, I, I'm no uh, lawyer, but I would think it would not, it would be considered a disease claim. Okay. And I'll, I may be contradicted by the, uh, the lawyers, but I, I think it is. Okay, let's see. Given the use of disease-specific supplements, how much is NHANES data and other observational data, set, data sets affected by reverse causality when looking at nutrient disease relationships? Uh, I don't know the answer. Maybe, Jamie, you know. It's a good point. It's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. It's always a limitation. It's always something we have to consider when we do use observational data sets. Um, and often we can't rule it out, of course. Um, that's why it's really important to look at longitudinal data sets when we're really assessing these disease um, uh, the basically health effects of dietary. Yeah, I think I think one thing in Haynes that's um, helpful is if, if the reverse causation was somebody was taking a, a joint health uh, supplement uh, and and the reverse causation was then you know you'd think that they would declare that they had the disease. Uh, the thing is, there's a health examination, and so there are tests. For instance, you can't just say I have kidney disease because they do take uh, urine samples and they get some idea of creatinine and so forth. So I'm not sure it's, a, it's as much of a problem in Haynes as it might be in some other surveys where you don't have health uh, status information that's simultaneously from clinical and biochemical indices. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, somebody said. Curing cancer with supplements got over 8 million hits. I'm sure that's not surprising. Um, yeah, it's discouraging. It, it, it really bothers me a lot. I can tell you that because all of those ads are coming up at the same time. And, and that bothers me a lot because it, it, to me, it suggests to people that they should be taking these things um, uh, to treat cancer. And we do have effective measures for treating many cancers. And it would be a shame if people want, turn to something that was not demonstrated to be effective when in fact there were treatments that were, um, that were effective. And I, uh, I know of patients who've gone that route and it's very tragic. Joanna, do you know what the FDA does with those kind of claims? Someone was asking if they can use the same, you know, like just doing a Google search and using that to monitor this kind of claims. Um, well, it's it, as I told you, it, it's going down a rabbit hole. It is so difficult to do this. I've got wonderful students and they spend a year sometimes doing this. FDA has done this. With in conjunction with FTC, I think with a number of claims, uh, I know they did one recently on diabetes mellitus, looking at some of the more outrageous uh, uh, ads for uh, people claiming that they could cure uh, diabetes with a, a supplement. But it's very difficult to do, and I'll have to defer that to uh, our colleagues at FDA. I know they do all they can to try to keep this um, to a minimum. But as you know, if there are probably a couple hundred thousand supplements, it's very difficult to do. The internet constantly changes. These companies, once they're pinpointed, take down the claim and then they'll put it up again two months later. It's just a, a mess. 
Thank you. So we have another question. Um, is anyone looking at the dangers of consumers getting vitamins, supplement, nutritional, or disease-related information um, that is actually written by chatbot? And I'm not sure you have that. The Holy cow. Go on it, but I think we are all worried about that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, there's a National Academy of Sciences has a two two part, I think, uh, uh, series that they're just beginning on misinformation. And some people on, in the audience may be interested in signing up for listening into that. But it's a huge area. And if anybody on the on the uh, web is is interested in an area to do some research on, that's a good one. Okay. Okay, let's see. Is it possible that such claims are coming up based upon misinformation, press releases on research studies that gain popularity and not because the company is making such a claim? So this sure. is the cancer yeah. claims, of course. And yeah, absolutely. It's possible. Uh, just take a look yourselves. It changes every day. So I, the stuff, the, 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 uh, the shots I took that, that I showed you were taken two years ago. So something else may come up now. It's a mess, a huge mess. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think that's it. I do not see any other questions. Oh, there was one more question earlier that was asking about the Hispanic, uh, the neural tube defect prevalence among Hispanics. I don't know whether you want to comment about that and in terms of fortification and supplement use? Is the prevalence uh, the same? Has it gone down? Is it higher? I'm okay. sorry, I don't know the answer. I, I think we're, for all groups, it's gone down and I would assume it's gone down in uh, Mexican Americans because my, I, I believe I'm right on this, Jamie. Uh, I believe that uh, Masa was fortified about three or four years ago. Masa, yeah. you know, that you make tortillas out of. And yeah. so the concern 10 or 15 years ago was, well, it's great that you put, uh, you know, that, that there's fortification of whole wheat flour and flour, but we use corn flour and it's not, uh, it's not fortified, but now I believe it is. So I would assume that uh, that would go down. Of course, that's not the only issue, but it does raise the level of folic acid nutriture before pregnancy a little, and it may be enough to stave off those defects. Yeah, I actually shared um, a really good paper that was published recently um, that used NHANES to look into this. So, uh, you know, surveillance data has highlighted that continued disparity in neural tube defects um, by race ethnicity in the United States. In 2016, that's when the um, voluntary folic acid fortification of corn masa flour um, started. And so these co these authors of this paper did look at the pre and then post fortification to see if there were big differences in the red blood cell folate concentrations in Hispanic women. Unfortunately, they didn't see in, repro in reproductive age women a huge difference and this didn't also correlate with changes in um, neural tube defects. But again, um, there's still, so this really concluded that there's remaining risk, but we have to continue this monitoring um, and then look at more of a long-term efficacy of voluntary uh, fortification of the corn masa flour. Yeah. So and the other thing, I think it would be helpful to do some studies of motivations there to find out why they're, um, whether it's that the message isn't getting through or what it is uh, in terms of prenatal supplements, particularly when who, they're, who want to give a child. Okay, let's see. Um, oh, we have a funny question. What supplements, if any, do those who work at ODS take? <laughs> I'll tell you. I'll I'll tell you what I take. I take a, a calcium vitamin D supplement. Okay, great. Thank you. 
<laughs> and I, I take a generic because I think uh, the generics, I take the, uh, you know, Walgreens, CVS, whatever pharmacy I happen to go into. And I take it in the, um, what's recommended by the uh, U of Preventive Health Services Task Force. Great. Thank you for that disclosure. <laughs> I uh, took a prenatal when I was pregnant. <laughs> anyway, thank, thank you, Dr. Dwyer. Um, well, let me let me give you one other thing on the prenatals. You know, the prenatal is one thing, but there are a whole bunch of people getting fertility treatments, and all of these these are not being well studied. And and we think that there's a need to really take a look at some of these. Uh, other conditions that people who are having babies in their 30s and 40s are using fertility treatments and the doctors are prescribing all sorts of stuff. And there's no reason to think that most of it's uh, possibly effective. We need to look at that. Definitely warrants further research. Um, thank you, Dr. Dwyer. Wonderful thank presentation. You, thank you. Um, we're going to now take a break from 1 to 1.15, um, then we're going to come back and we're going to have um, speakers from the Food, uh, Food and Drug Administration and also the Federal, Federal Trade Commission, sorry. Um, so Great. we're going to have our session two, rules and regulations. So thank you, and we'll see you back at 1.15. They'll correct everything I said. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Bye. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Johanna.
Hi, Patricia. Hi, Jamie. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I hear you great. All right. All right. I think let's. So far, so good. Been a great session discussion so far. Great. All right. Check. Um, I Hi, guess Jamie. we're ready to start. Hi, Mary. <laughs> um, so um, we're gonna start up. This session is rules and regulations, and our moderator is Dr. Patricia Haggerty. Thank you, Patricia. Okay. Thank you. It's nice to be here. I'll be a moderator for this session. As Jamie said, this session is going to be about rules and regulations. And we have two speakers for the session, both of them attorneys. Uh, one is with the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, and the other is with the Federal Trade Commission. Um, I'll introduce each one right before their, uh, right before their talk briefly. Uh, for the full biosketch, uh, please go to the uh, the speaker uh, biosketches and because it's too too long, they're too long to to uh, review uh, right now. But uh, our first speaker is uh, Ms. Jerry Voss, and uh, as I said, she's an attorney who joined the FDA's Office of Dietary Supplement Programs in March of 2021 as the director of the Division of Policy and Regulations Implementation. Um, her work focuses on providing subject matter expertise for dietary supplement specific guidelines, regulations, position papers, and educational aids, and directing the office's activities and responding to inquiries from various stakeholders. So I'll leave it at that. And um, uh, Jerry, please uh, go ahead. Thank you so much. I'm just going to share my screen. One moment, please. Okay, share and then slideshow. Okay. Uh, so today I'm gonna to be speaking about um, how the FDA regulates dietary supplements. My work at ODSP involves all of the areas that we're gonna talk about today. Uh, new dietary ingredient notifications, good manufacturing practices, dietary supplement labeling, et cetera. Uh, the primary authority for dietary supplement regulation comes from the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, which actually governs all FDA-regulated commodities. The first law that defined the regulation of dietary supplements is the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, or DSHEA, which passed in 1994. DSHEA laid out the major framework for dietary supplements and provided most of the requirements that I'll be talking about today, but primarily it defines the term dietary supplement, it established requirements for new dietary ingredient pre-market review, made it a requirement to comply with current good manufacturing practices or CGMPs, and it included dietary supplements under the adulteration provisions of the act. So in order to discuss how FDA regulates dietary supplements, I think it's helpful to begin by defining what it is we regulate and what we do not regulate. So a dietary supplement is defined as a product other than tobacco that's intended to supplement the, di the diet. And supplement the diet, we mean augment the diet to promote health. Um, it also has to be something that's ingested. So that's something that's ingested internally into the stomach or GI tract. Um, so it couldn't be an inhaled product, for example, a sublingual and injectable. It also can't be something that's considered the sole item of a meal or diet, um, something that's um, represented perhaps as a conventional food. And it also must be labeled as a dietary supplement. So there are several ways that the law specifically distinguishes dietary supplements from drugs. Here are um, three of them listed right here. It can't be um, approved as a new drug or antibiotic or biologic if it has been authorized for investigation and the existence of those investigations have been made public, um, unless the article was marketed as a dietary supplement or food before such approval or authorization. So it's sort of a, a mouthful of, uh, and it's a, actually a very long definition, um, but this is what we are working with from the statute. So I want to talk a little bit more about dietary supplements versus drugs. So dietary supplements are further 
uh, distinguished from drugs because a drug is intended to diagnose, cure, mitigate, or prevent disease. So dietary supplements can't make those claims. But uh, both dietary supplements and drugs can be intended to affect the structure or function of the body. And so there are requirements for dietary supplement manufacturers to follow if they want to make structure function claims. Uh, one thing I want to also mention is that uh, there is no pre-market approval for dietary supplements. That is obviously different from the pre-market approval requirements for drugs. So uh, dietary supplements and INDs, this is a very complicated issue. It's, a, it's an evolving area. I think the best thing to do if you have a question about this is um, to contact FDA. There are several considerations if an IND is required, uh, including whether or not the intended population is vulnerable. Basically, if the clinical investigation is intended only to evaluate the dietary supplement's effect on the structure or function of the body, then an IND is not required. But if the clinical investigation is intended to evaluate the supplement's ability to diagnose, cure, mitigate, treat, or prevent a disease, then an IND is required. There are uh, a few important links here. FDA's most recent action on this issue is the proposed rule in December 22nd. That's the third link below. Uh, December, two th December 2022, and that's the third link below here. Okay. So in addition to distinguishing dietary supplements from drugs, they're also distinguished from conventional foods. I mentioned that briefly earlier. A conventional food is defined under 201F of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act as an article used for food or drink by man um, or other animals, chewing gum, or articles used for components of such of such an article. So we're talking about soups, fruits and vegetables, ready to eat meals, candy, except, et cetera. Uh, dietary supplements can't be represented as a conventional food and they can't be represented as the sole item of a meal or diet. There are also quite different labeling requirements associated with nutrition labeling. Um, conventional foods have a nutrition facts panel, dietary supplements have a supplement facts panel. I'll get more into that. Uh, in just a bit. So the regulatory responsibilities uh, associated with dietary supplements. Dietary supplement regulation generally covers these sort of main points. Facility regulation, uh, new dietary ingredient notifications, or what we refer to as NDINs, CGMPs, dietary supplement labeling, and adverse event reporting. So for facility res registration, I think it's important to emphasize here that this is a food facility reg registration, not for products. So this is not a product listing. This requirement comes from the Bioterrorism Act of, 20, of 2002 um, as a result of 9-11. Uh, for that reason, the registration information is actually not publicly disclosed. There are certain categories of registration and under uh, the FISMA law of 2011, those re renewal of registration has to happen every two years. And this registration by a facility is an acknowledgement that FDA can inspect the facility. So as I mentioned, new dietary ingredient notifications or NDINs is a very big area for ODSP. It uh, established the requirement that manufacturers are just Distributors must submit a notification to FDA 75 days before a new dietary ingredient is marketed. This is not an approval, it's a notification and a review of FDA, and it's actually FDA's only opportunity for some level of pre-market review required, uh, by uh, dietary supplements. So the NDIN um, notification requirement is for those products that contain an NDI, which is defined as an ingredient that was not marketed um, in a dietary supplement before October 15th of 94, which is the date that Deshea was signed into law. And then during the review period, the 75 days, FDA reviews the notification and provides a response. Reviewers will look at information regarding identity, history of safe use, conditions of use, uh, these three required components for the NDI notification. 
Uh, this is just a chart that we have on our website that I think is a helpful um, summarization as to whether or not you can determine if, you're in, if the ingredient you're looking at is considered a new dietary ingredient. Okay. So next slide, 13. Okay, so current good manufacturing practices. Current good manufacturing practices, this is, is a large part of FDA's post-market regulation of dietary supplements. And it actually applies to both domestic and foreign, just foreign manufacturers of dietary supplements. FDA published a quite lengthy rule in 2007 seven, and this was codified um, in the CFR. It includes uh, 16 different subparts, uh, deals with manufacturing, packaging, labeling, and holding of dietary supplements. I would say the regulation has an emphasis on production and process controls, i.e. building quality into the product, as well as requirements for testing uh, at the raw material and at the finished product stage. So uh, GMP inspections, FDA investigators confirm CGMP compliance through numerous inspections um, each year and non-compliance can result in FDA action, um, which generally would include issuance of, a, of an FDA warning letter. Failure to comply with the observations made by FDA during the course of this investigation actually could result in further enforcement actions down the road, such as seizure of the products or injunctions to perhaps prevent further manufacturing of the products. While there may be organizations out there that purport to actually certify dietary supplements and independent organizations testing cannot guarantee safety or effectiveness. That's something I like to stress um, in all of my presentations. Uh, foreign manufacturers that are found to be non-compliant with CGMPs will be placed on what's known as an import alert. And this is basically a regulatory tool that FDA uses to alert field staff and the public that the agency has enough evidence to allow for detention um, of the product and refusal and um, that these products appear to be in violation of FDA laws and regulations. Okay, so dietary supplement labeling. This is also obviously a large uh, portion of our work in ODSP. Because dietary supplements are a category of foods, they've got to follow the FDA food labeling reg regulations. But because they're dietary supplements, they also have their own unique labeling. For example, they must be labeled as a dietary supplement. They have to actually use the statement that describes them as a dietary supplement. They've got to list all of their ingredients uh, and the ingredient would be formatted into a supplement facts panel. And I'll show an example of that in a bit. They, uh, the labeling also must contain the name and location of the manufacturer and distributor. And there also must be contact information. Basically it's uh, that contact information is there so that con consumers can submit reports of adverse events. There will also be permissible claims listed on the labeling. There are three types of claims, nutrient content claims, structure function claims, which I talked about um, previously, and I'll get into a little bit more on the next slide. And there's also authorized health claims or qualified health claims, which require prior authorization by FDA and are actually handled by another office in the uh, Food and Drug Administration. But what statements are permitted under these types of claims is spelled out in the federal regulations. Um, an example would be a claim regarding calcium or vitamin D and reducing the risk of osteoporosis. That would be that would fall under this authorized health claim or qualified health claim uh, bucket, basically. So this is an example of a dietary supplement facts panel. Um, the information, I think it's helpful to see the information sort of grouped into these three categories. Uh, group one has the servings. Obviously, there's the serving size listed there for pills, capsules, whatever the, the form is. 
Um, then on the second portion is the nutrients. So all of the nutrients are listed and the amount in milligrams or micrograms are there as well, uh, along with the percentage of daily value. Um, and uh, this is all based on the, the 2000 calorie a day diet. And then on the third portion of the panel is the other ingredients. These can be binders, fillers, um, uh, preservatives, sweeteners, that sort of thing. Uh, this is another example of a dietary supplement labeling, just so you can kind of see it in the context of an actual package. I tried to clear out the uh, identifying information, but hopefully you can see kind of how this is, should look on a regular package. There's the supplement facts panel. Uh, there's the listing of the other, other ingredients below. You can see the disclaimer on the bottom of the uh, left picture. That disclaimer is what is used whenever you need to, whenever you're looking to have a structure function claim on your labeling. Okay, so structure function notifications. So as I mentioned, under DSHEA, dietary supplements can bear what, what are referred to as structure function claims. Um, they can also have nutrient deficiency, disease claims, and general well-being claims without being uh, regulated as a drug, just so long as they also submit uh, required information under 403R6 of the Food and Drug Act, which I noted there. Uh, firms are required to basically maintain substantiation of the claim. They include that disclaimer language, which is that language that I pointed out on the previous slide. They are also required to notify FDA no later than 30 days after marketing the product containing the claim. So uh, that's the structure function claim notification. That notification goes to our staff in ODSP. They review the structure function claim, but they don't actually uh, they don't actually approve that claim. Uh, as I mentioned as well, uh, firms are required to maintain that substantiation. That substantiation is going to be things like tests, uh, analyses, research, studies, or other evidence um, based on the expertise of professionals in the area. Um, manufacturers um, must have the support uh, by what we refer to as competent and reliable, and reliable scientific evidence that the claim being made here is truthful. Uh, when the manufacturer submits the structure function claim, they have to include a text of the claim in their notification. Uh, FDA then reviews it to make sure that this is not a disease claim. The, uh, the structure function claim, if it's found to be violative, that is basically making a disease claim, FDA sends what's known as a courtesy letter uh, to that manufacturer distributor notifying them. And then FDA investigators will follow up with the firm um, if these violative claims are not fixed. Um, but if the claim is appropriate, um, i.e. does not make a disease claim, then there would be no response from FDA. So it's a no news is good news thing. Just a little bit more on structure function notifications. I think it's important to highlight that the definition of disease for dietary supplements isn't just the actual disease itself, um, but it's also a general state of health leading to such dysfunction. So I've got a, a, a list of some disease claims there that um, are, are just some examples of things that we've seen over the years. There are many of them. Okay, adverse event reporting. So uh, if a manufacturer receives an adverse event report and determines that it's serious, the manufacturer has 15 business days to forward it on to FDA. A year later, the manufacturer should also provide an update with any new or uh, relative information that they might relevant information that they might have learned pertaining to that adverse event report. 
And this uh, reporting system works through uh, FDA's AER program and submissions can be made through our electronic portal, email, phone calls, letters, et cetera. Once that adverse event is entered into our safety reporting portal, the dietary supplement specific reports are then entered into what we refer to as CARES, and that stands for the CIFSAN Adverse Event Reporting System Database. So that from the CARES database, the ODSP reviewers will then evaluate those cases and determine if any follow-up is needed uh, with the individual submitter. We um, uh, ODSP reviewers, are, which who are generally medical officers in that case, uh, they'll be responsible for recognizing any triggers that might be evident with respect to specific firms, products, or ingredients, any trends that might be alarming that need to be um, uh, followed up on. So if one of these triggers is identified and then FDA action may be necessary, um, the a facility inspection also may be warranted. These are generally referred to a uh, what we call four cause inspections. It's also possible that a product recall could be necessary. Uh, if a firm doesn't believe though that a re recall is necessary, but FDA does, we can just we can issue a public warning that consumers avoid a certain product or ingredient due to safety concerns. There are um, a couple of examples of when triggers were present include um, some weight loss products that are out there, some sports enhancement products that are out there. Both of these products uh, showed several cases of liver damage. I believe it was hydroxycut and Oxyelite Pro. And um, it was actually able to be traced to the product that was not necessarily a specific ingredient. And in both cases, the products were actually recalled. Uh, our adverse event report uh, includes searchable data data from the database. So um, it also includes data submitted by health care practitioners, data voluntarily reported by the industry, and mandatory reports from the dietary supplement industry from January of 04 going forward. So that's all in the, our database. So in addition to sending warning letters for uh, CGMPs and labeling violations, FDA is also responsible for taking action against unsafe dietary supplement products after they are marketed in the United States. So uh, as part of our post-market surveillance, FDA has issued warnings about substances in numerous products. For example, uh, in 2020, FDA warned consumers to avoid using dietary supplements dietary supplements containing cesium chloride. Um, we issued five warning letters. We will obviously continue to market, to watch the marketplace for these types of products. Uh, other types of warning letters on uh, ingredient specific warning letters would be CBD, TNEptin, which I feel like we're hearing quite a bit about these days, Phenobut, uh, DMHA, and then other NDIs. ODSP has also initiated several what we refer to as claims initiatives in the past years uh, to remove products from the market that are uh, claimed to cure, treat, or prevent disease that are targeted towards specific populations. It's uh, helpful for industry to see and for consumers to kind of see all these products together. It makes more of a media impact and uh, it gets the important information out. Um, some of these these claims initiatives were joint actions, actually, with the Food and Drug, uh, I'm sorry, with the uh, Federal Trade Commission, uh, who you'll be hearing from after this. Uh, we did, I think, at least 25 warning letters with FTC regarding COVID-19. We also did a joint action with FTC regarding diabetes. Um, and then there's a few other uh, claims initiatives listed there, depression and mental health, hangover, uh, issues, opioid addiction, Alzheimer's, and I think our most recent one, cardiovascular dis disease. Um, and then in addition to sort of these claims initiatives, we did do a warning letter initiative recently that targeted specific ingredients rather than just claims. And those um, 
uh, supplements, those were supplements that included hygienamine, hortamine, and octopamine. So next is the ingredient directory. So there's no comprehensive list of ingredients that are allowed or prohibited in dietary supplements, um, but the FDA, we are trying to provide this directory to help manufacturers, retailers, and consumers kind of more easily locate uh, information that's already available on the agency's web website or their, their archives, um, and also to stay informed about FDA actions and communications with regard to specific ingredients found in products marketed as dietary supplements. So um, you can see there's the link here uh, on the slide. Basically, we hope that this new dietary ingredient um, I'm sorry, this new ingredient directory will serve as a quick reference tool for these types of, uh, of these types of actions and, and ingredients. The directory also hopefully will provide more useful information for stakeholders who are looking to learn more about the agency's thinking regarding specific ingredients. And this is a living list. Um, we have had at least one update to it so far. We continue to update it um, as we kind of sift through more information, as we get comments from uh, individuals. And so, so please go ahead and check that out. And then lastly, I wanted to mention our educational initiatives. Um, last year, FDA launched what we refer to as the Supplement Your Knowledge Education Initiative, which is intended to broaden the public's understanding of dietary supplements and how FDA actually reg regulates them. We had uh, this, this uh, link, which is noted below, includes materials for consumers, for educators, for physicians, and actually also for healthcare professionals. We had a collaboration for, with uh, the American Medical Association to develop a CME program with uh, for physicians and other he healthcare professionals. And this included uh, videos and information uh, to provide this uh, to physicians and healthcare professionals. Uh, FDA is continue, continuing to explore ways to better educate the public uh, regarding the use of dietary supplements and our role in educating them. As you know, the statute uh, gives FDA the authority and responsibility to educate the public on these issues. So <clears throat> this educational initiative, the, the Supplement Your Knowledge initiative, as well as other educational initiatives are designed to do just that. Pardon me. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to, to listen to my presentation. My contact information is below, and I am, would be very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jerry. That was super interesting. Uh, and the audience thought so, too, because we had quite a few questions. I hope, uh, I don't know if we can get through them all, but we'll, we'll do our best. Um, so just start from the beginning. Um, the first question is, how often does ORA utilize Google and Amazon searches to easily find companies violating the disease claim rule? Would not, would, would not that be an easy way to, quote, fish, unquote, for those crossing the line, getting warning letters out, and help better conformance with the regulations? So, so that's a great question. Um, uh, that is a tool that is used by ORA, um, and it is also used sometimes with, within ODSP as well. Um, during COVID, for example, when it was uh, not possible for ORA inspectors to go out and inspect dietary supplement facilities, there was uh, an extensive amount of checking websites um, getting warning letters out based on those websites, and then continuing to follow up to make sure that the manufacturers or products with these claims on their websites did in fact go ahead and remedy them. So that was extremely popular during COVID, but still remains um, among the tools that ORA uses to, uh, to find these issues, yes. Okay, great. Um, so thank you for all that you do. Within ORA, can you explain how the various units of FDA, uh, CF, SANS operate and interact? 
Okay, so um, so the Office of Regulatory Affairs, which I believe this person is referring to, is a separate, well, right now is a separate office um, under FDA. And um, CIFSAN, so ODSP is under CIFSAN. You may have heard that the FDA has uh, also put out a um, an explanation that they're kind that we're moving through a re reorganization and this re reorganization process um, likely is going to have an impact on um, where some of these organizations all sit within FDA those details are still being worked out um, and I believe the plan has to go to Congress for uh, approval so FDA is con continuing to put out as much information as possible there are um, I believe there's links on our website to learn more about this new vision and this reorganization plan. Um, so I would suggest that this person perhaps go ahead and check that out because I think it will provide some helpful information as to how all of these entities operate together and suggestions for how that might change in the future. Very good. Okay. Uh, what about a patented article that has not been in the food supply and is a totally synthetic article that does not fit any of the definitions of a dietary ingredient. I guess, I guess the question is, what is what, what do you think about that? What, what is that <laughs> about that? <laughs> um, well, um, so as I mentioned, the the definition of dietary supplement and dietary ingredient is quite a complicated one. Um, and unfortunately, there will always be companies out there that are trying to find a way around to avoid. Uh, regulation, however possible. Um, I think that for the most part, what we see is that the companies may try to avoid being regulated as a drug so that they can be regulated as a dietary supplement instead. Um, but um, there are obviously uh, ingredients out there in products that are marketed as a dietary supplement that likely fall under those scenarios that this individual is referring to. Um, we continue to watch the marketplace. If the, if the product is being marketed as a dietary supplement and contains uh, synthetic ingredients, what, what um, this individual referenced, we would have the ability to enforce against it um, if it's if it's marketed in that way. But unfortunately, there are companies that, um, like I said, are always trying to find ways around and won't say won't have a supplement facts panel, won't have the um, won't have the the indication that this is a dietary supplement, those types of things that would make it a dietary supplement. And then unfortunately it does fall into a gray area. Those, um, they would likely be referred to the Center for Drugs and Eva Drug Evaluation and Research to, um, to analyze what we can do with them, but they could potentially be a food depending on how they're being marketed. Um, so we do try to find other ways to utilize our authorities to enforce, it just may not be that we enforce using dietary supplement authorities. Okay, okay thank you. Mm -hmm. um, is there a database that would let us know when a dietary supplement is an NDI? Um, so that, that's a great question. There's a couple of things that I would mention there. Um, I, I would recommend looking at the uh, the ingredient directory, first of all, because that does have helpful information. Um, for example, there's links to NDIN notifications. You can see what the NDI notification says about particular ingredients. So I think that pro provides helpful information if you've got a specific ingredient um, in your mind that you want to look up. If there's um, a company that you are more specific in, uh, more specifically interested in, we also have on our website, um, and it can be, I believe, downloaded into an Excel spreadsheet, and it would list out all of the NDIN notifications that we have issued, and you can get more information on each individual NDIN. So I mentioned that the NDINs, we have 75 days to review, but at the 90th day after it's submitted, we then place these NDI notifications on this list. 
Um, it's also a list, if you go to our website, uh, under the new dietary ingredient process, new dietary ingredient notification process, you'll see a list of basically it's the 75 day list we refer to it as um, all of the um, all of the NDINs that we have reviewed in 70 in 75 days. So you can check out that list there, and also our response letters to NDI notifications are posted on regulations.gov. So you can do some searches through there to hopefully find the information that you're looking for. Okay, great. Uh, so a couple of questions uh, about uh, GMP, uh, good manufacturing practice. Um, uh, so I'll put them together. Um, mm -hmm. How often does an FDA complete, how often does the FDA complete a GMP inspection for each company? Or what is the average time range for how often they complete this per supplement company? And then the other question is, is, is there an actual certification uh, for a GMP? And does that tend to be part of, uh, say, IRB approval for a study using? Okay. Oh, so there's a few questions there. Um, so the the time it takes for FDA to conduct an inspection will vary depend uh, depending on the size of the uh, manufacturer or distributor and the number of products that they have. Um, I guess most inspections that I see take about a week or so uh, to get through. Um, uh, my understanding is that there is there's not a uh, there's not like a seal of approval that says hey you've you know complied with CGMPs, um, but uh, I would encourage folks to listen into my colleague um, Rebecca Allen is going to be doing a presentation on CGMPs on Wednesday, and she'll get a little bit more in depth on these types of issues um, and can provide some more information for you, um, as well as um, uh, inspection counts and, and the number of times that they get to certain organizations. Okay, fair enough, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's uh, several questions, more questions about uh, the NDI, but then there's the one question that is kind of unique on its own, so I'll ask you that one. Mm -hmm. um, can the lovastatin in blue oyster mushroom, marketed as biologic, Okay. versus synthetic lovastatin by pharma industry marketed as drug be promoted for the same condition? Um, that's a that's a complicated issue. I would have to talk with our folks in the center in, in the uh, division of research evaluation. That's the other side of our office to get more information on that in the Division of Research and Evaluation. Um, if this individual wants to send an email to odsp at fda.hhs.gov, um, we'd be happy to kind of think through that a little bit more rather than just me providing an off-the-cuff answer because it's a bit more complicated. Okay, very good. Um, so back to the uh, NDIs. Okay. Um, there are numerous erroneous NDIs that with all due respect to the FDA, the FDA has missed um, that could put consumers at risk. Uh, so uh, what, what is your response? What, what if the uh, NDI has errors in it and the FDA, and the FDA does not catch these errors? Um, well, the information in the NDI responses are public, um, as this person knows. So um, the that individual, an individual, if they spot what they believe is an error, they certainly can reach out to FDA. Um, but uh, I'm not aware of if there's specific products this person has in mind. But there are certainly mechanisms they that uh, an individual can reach out to FDA to discuss this to uh, mention this issue. Okay. Um, has the draft guidance of May 2022 on new dietary ingredient notification requirements been finalized? In particular, what is the status of expectations for safety assurance related to toxicities that are not? readily recognizable unless prospective studies are undertaken, for example, cancer induction, delayed neurotoxicity, reproductive effects, et cetera. In general, epidemiological studies of safe history of use would not identify these types of effects before 
extensive harm that had, had occurred. Okay, so um, the May 2022 NDI guidance that this individual was referring to, um, we uh, have we are in the process of evaluating comments that we received with respect to this particular guidance. And um, I, I know we have a comment period, but people can comment at any time with respect to a guidance document. We have stated publicly that we are looking to finalize um, portions of our um, larger NDI guidance, and um, we'd like to have those go out to the public, um, and we continue to work on them. This is, I'm referring to the 2016 uh, NDI guidance. We think it'll be more helpful to folks if they have that information and then can go forward um, with hopefully finalizing the other guidance that you mentioned. Um, but we are still evaluating comments that are coming in uh, with respect to that guidance. Um, so we have time for a few more, but I don't think we're going to be able to cover all of them. Uh, JB, can you um, let us know, Will, um, we be able to respond to the additional questions later um, through email or some other other way if we don't get to them verbally today? Yes, we will have um, the output of all the chat and the Q&A, and we can provide it to the um, speakers to respond to and then send it out to everyone. Okay, thank you. So a couple more questions. Um, can you elaborate on the history of use uh, for NDIN, particularly for microbes and enzymes used in probiotics and other dietary supplements. For example, I have a microbe that I want to submit uh, an NDIN. I did an ANI strain comparison to show that my microbe is similar to a microbe found in kimchi. Kimchi is largely consumed in Southeast Asia in conventional food for centuries with no adverse events. Is this enough to show the history of use? So um, I wouldn't be able to comment on a specific uh, ingredient in this forum. Um, I also should mention I'm not a scientist, so um, it's it's not appropriate for, for me to, to comment specifically on that item. I think that um, if this individual is interested in moving forward with an NDI, um, an NDI notification, they should check out our website, um, which has information regarding meetings with FDA regarding NDINs and information as to what constitutes, uh, what, what FDA is looking for with respect to history of use. I would also recommend that this person also look at the 2016 NDI guidance. Um, while it has not been finalized yet, it does provide some helpful information with respect to what constitutes history of use. Okay. Uh so do the same rules apply to supplements with advanced delivery systems, for example, nanoparticle based products? So um, for a nanoparticle based product, we would have to um, first determine whether or not it um, meets the definition of a dietary supplement, for example, is it ingested? Um, I'm not as familiar with nano type particles, um, but if it's something that's ingested and it has the uh, indication that it's a dietary supplement on the package and it has the supplement facts uh, panel, we would go ahead and uh, review it and regulate it as a dietary supplement. However, if it's not marketed as a dietary supplement and does not have those indicators that we look for, this likely would be something that would be evaluated elsewhere with an FDA. Okay. Well, I'm going to squeeze one more question okay. in, um, and um, hopefully uh, this, this, this could be a, a quick answer for you. What are the FDA's priorities over the next two to three years? Great question. Um, I, I, obviously, our priorities are really aligned with consumer safety. We want to provide um, 
We want to provide information for consumers to make um, informed decisions. We want to do what we can to ensure consumer safety. Um, and we want to, you know, stay in, on top of the market as best as possible. While FDA does not have mandatory product listing, um, we appreciate all of the mechanisms that are out there and people informing us of uh, potential issues so that we can utilize our resources properly. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jerry. We, we got to nearly all the questions. Okay. Um, but um, that was very interesting, obviously a topic that uh, many, many people are interested in. So uh, again, great presentation. My pleasure, um, thank you. So we'll go on to the next speaker. Um, and that is uh, Ms. Mary Johnson. Uh, as I mentioned, also an attorney. Uh, Ms. Johnson joined the FTC's Bureau of Consumer Protection in 2005 as a senior staff attorney in the Division of Advertising Practices. Her work focuses on investigating unfair or deceptive trade practices involved in involving health-related products and services. During her tenure at the FTC, she has litigated several complex advertising claim substantiation cases including claims for products marketed for weight loss, orthopedic ailments, cardiovascular disease, and prostate cancer. She also worked, uh, she's also worked on various policy matters involving youth-focused advertising, such as FTC's reports to Congress on food marketing to children and adolescents. So, um, Mary Johnson, please go ahead with your presentation. Uh, thanks so much for having me. I am, I pre-recorded my con my presentation because allergies are affecting my voice. So I think J uh, Jamie's team is going to uh, play that. Yes, Mary, I'm working on that right now. Okay. Good afternoon. I'm happy to be here today to continue the tradition of FTC's participation in the Mary Francis Picciano Dietary Supplement Research Practicum. There are a wide range of dietary supplements on the market, those with health benefits supported by extensive scientific research, and those that are promising but need further study. Unfortunately, there are also products on the market that are not supported by any science, are supported by junk science, or may even be unsafe. It is the latter categories of products, those that don't provide the advertised health benefits or that may be harmful, that are the focus of FTC's enforcement efforts. FTC's consumer protection mission, how the FTC enforces dietary supplement and food advertising, and the intersection between FTC and FDA jurisdiction over these products, and what we at the FTC have been doing recently to protect consumers and to provide guidance to industry to ensure dietary supplement claims are backed by sound science. Let me start with a disclaimer that my comments today are my own and do not necessarily reflect the views of the commission or any individual commissioner. Okay, let me talk a little bit about F FTC's consumer protection mission. The FTC is a small, independent law enforcement agency. In addition to enforcing competition laws, a key mission of ours is to protect consumers by stopping deceptive and unfair practices in commerce wherever they occur. Protecting consumers from misleading health claims is an important agency priority. We do this using a variety of tools, such as suing companies and individuals who violate FTC laws, developing rules and guidance for industry, 
and preparing consumer education materials. Except for a few regulated industries like airlines and banks, the FTC has jurisdiction over a wide range of consumer products and services. The various divisions of the Bureau of Consumer Protection oversee issues including consumer privacy, identity theft, and information security, internet, telephone, and direct mail scams, false or unfair business loans, financing and leasing transactions, and debt collection practices, just to name a few. In my division, advertising practices, many of the matters that we investigate pertain to health-related products and services. We have brought numerous such enforcement actions over the years. For example, a few noteworthy food cases are Palm Wonderful, who we sued for making prostate cancer prevention and other disease claims about their pomegranate juice and pill supplements. Kellogg Cereal, we challenged Kellogg's marketing of frosted mini wheats, which the company advertised as clinically shown to improve kids' attentiveness by nearly 20%. We've investigated a variety of dietary supplements and brought cases involving supplements marketed for arthritis, osteoporosis, and other bone and joint ailments. This was an ad for a supplement called Synovia, which includes a prominent claim of 95% pain relief so good, the gentleman in this photo apparently gave away his walker. We've also investigated various sellers of CBD containing products marketed to prevent or treat serious diseases and conditions such as cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, and AIDS. We've also looked at supplements advertised for opiate withdrawal. This was an ad for a product, Elimidrol, which among other things claimed to provide the relief you need from the first dose. And we've looked at, at supplements marketed to improve cognitive function. As you may know, the New York Attorney General and the FTC are currently in litigation against the makers of Prevagen. During the pandemic, we saw um, supplements advertised to mitigate or prevent COVID. For example, last year, the FTC San Francisco office brought a case against the marketer of COVID resist and virus resist. That litigation is ongoing in the Northern District of California. We've challenged health claims for other types of products as well. For example, Skechers advertising of its sports shoes for muscle toning, weight loss, and cardiovascular health. And the marketer of the online brain game Lumosity, whose claims included improved school and work performance and reduced cognitive impairment associated with health conditions like Alzheimer's, ADHD, and chemo fog. So what type of advertising does the FTC look at when investigating deceptive and unfair practices in commerce? We look at all forms of marketing. That includes traditional ads, such as TV, radio, and print, online and mobile ads, including websites, social media platforms, blogs, marketing emails and text messages, and newer forms of online marketing, uh, such as games, for example, the brain training game that I mentioned in the previous slide, and adver games as well. It also includes public relations activities, such as press releases, event sponsorship, and word of mouth marketing. And we also look at product labeling and packaging. Although, as I will explain shortly, we defer to FDA on dietary supplement and food labeling. You can get a sense from the slide I showed a few minutes ago, what are FTC's enforcement priorities? 
products marketed for serious diseases and conditions, marketed to children or to older consumers with age-related conditions, products that pose health and safety risks, or that are marketed with outright false claims, and products that pose widespread or substantial injury to the public. Okay, let's delve into the basics of FTC dietary supplement advertising law. I'm not going to bore you with a lot of statutory references. There are just two provisions of the FTC Act to mention. Section 5 of the FTC Act is really broad. It prohibits unfair or deceptive acts or practices in commerce. So that could pertain to advertising of dietary supplements, food, automobiles, video games, or event tickets to, let's say, a Taylor Swift concert. Section 12 of the Act is more specific. It prohibits the dissemination of false ads for foods, drugs, devices, and cosmetics. Although this provision does not specifically mention dietary supplements, it covers them as either a food or a drug, depending on the advertised claims. In a nutshell, the law stands for two principles. First, ads must be truthful and not misleading. And second, objective claims for ads must be substantiated before they are made. The approach we take to analyzing whether an ad for a dietary supplement or food is deceptive boils down to two key questions, which are illustrated by this cartoon. The first question, what are the advertising claims conveyed? Here, the advertiser knows what he wants to convey to consumers. Eating chocolate will make you look younger and thinner, if only that were true. The second question that we look at, are the claims substantiated? In this illustration, not surprisingly, the researchers haven't found any data to back up the anti-aging and weight loss claims for chocolate. Under FTC law, marketers are responsible for the truthfulness of advertising claims they expressly make and the claims that are reasonably implied. In order to identify the express and implied claims, we focused on the messages that an ad communicates to consumers. In other words, we evaluate the consumer's understanding or takeaway from the ad, not the advertiser's intent we look at the overall net impression of the ad, the interplay between the various elements, text, graphics, product name, rather than individual components in isolation. For example, a dietary supplement that is advertised expressly with the words joint support, nevertheless may convey that the product relieves joint ailments, such as arthritis, if the words joint support are accompanied by a before video of an older person bent over a cane and an after clip of that person jogging on the beach. We also examine consumer and expert testimonials used to promote health products. Those testimonials may make claims about the safety, efficacy, or performance of a product and advertisers need to have appropriate substantiation for such claims. And we examine whether an ad is misleading because it fails to disclose key qualifying information. For example, significant safety risks or limitations on the advertised efficacy. Disclosure of qualifying information must be clear and conspicuous to consumers. In other words, it needs to be easy to understand and unavoidable. That can be challenging depending on the product, the science, and the advertising medium. 
If it's not possible to make an effective disclosure, it's important to modify the claim or not make the claim. Here are two examples from the Palm Wonderful litigation, which I worked on. In each ad, there's a prominent visual of the pomegranate juice bottle. On the left, dressed like a superhero who is off to save prostates, and on the right, hooked up to EKG leads with the tagline, Amaze Your Cardiologist. The visuals alone convey hard-hitting health efficacy messages, which are reinforced by the text below each. The prostate superhero ad states that the juice is backed by $25 million in vigilant medical research and cites a prostate study. The Amaze Your Cardiologist ad says, ace your EKG, and that a glass a day of the juice can reduce plaque by up to 30%, again citing a scientific study. The net impression of these ads is that the juice will reduce the risk of prostate cancer and heart disease. Health claims for dietary supplements and other products need to be supported by competent and reliable scientific evidence. This is a rigorous standard based on accepted norms of experts in the relevant fields of study. There's no fixed formula for the number, length, or size of the studies, but they need to be high quality human clinical trials. At the end of the day, consumers should be able to have confidence in the accuracy of information presented in health product advertising. What do we mean by high quality studies? If a company claims expressly or implicitly that its supplement has a demonstrated health benefit, the studies needed to be well designed and well controlled to yield accurate and reliable results. For example, they should be randomized, controlled, double blind clinical trials to minimize bias. They should have a sample size and duration adequate to ensure that they are sufficiently powered. They should use appropriate primary outcome measures. With regard to data analysis, the results should be statistically significant and clinically meaningful. A study may show that an intervention had a statistically significant reduction on a biomarker of inflammation and yet no meaningful clinical effect on the study's primary outcome, for instance, reduction in knee pain. We look critically at how study results are presented and whether there has been selective reporting or a positive spin put on null or negative results. Did the study fail to show a positive effect on the primary outcome and yet emphasize results of a post hoc analysis of an exploratory secondary outcome? When reporting results of a randomized controlled trial, did the authors present only before and after observations of the placebo group and the intervention group rather than analyze the actual between group differences between the placebo group and the treatment group. We looked to see if the study was published in a reputable journal that has stringent publication requirements, including an adequate peer review process. And we examine study sponsorship and whether the manufacturers of the test product were involved in the study for example, protocol development, recruitment, data analysis. We look to see whether the study results have been replicated. Seeing consistent results across a range of studies increases confidence that an intervention is effective. That said, a collection of positively spun, poor quality studies does not constitute competent and reliable scientific evidence. Let's look at the Palm Wonderful case again, in which the science on their pomegranate products was not as wonderful as the advertised claims for heart disease, prostate cancer, and erectile dysfunction. 
Among other things, the company stated that Palm's health claims were backed by millions of dollars in research and that the benefits included a 30% decrease in arterial plaque, a slowing of prostate-specific antigen, or PSA, doubling time by nearly 350%, and a 50% greater likelihood of improved erections as compared to placebo. Several of the studies related to the heart disease claims had significant methodological limitations. No blinding, small sample sizes, lack of between group analyses, reliance on unvalidated biomarkers, post hoc analysis of interim study results. The results of the heart studies also were conflicting. One small study suggested a benefit for arterial plaque, whereas two subsequent larger studies found no benefit. The prostate cancer studies were uncontrolled pilot studies. Also, the men in the studies had undergone radical prostatectomies or other treatment that would have slowed PSA doubling time regardless of whether they consumed pomegranate juice. With regard to erectile dysfunction, the company relied on one human clinical trial. The primary outcome measure for the trial was not a validated instrument for erectile dysfunction and the results did not reach statistical significance using a validated secondary outcome measure. So what's the bottom line when it comes to FTC's approach to health claim substantiation? We don't evaluate studies in isolation. We consider all of the relevant evidence. We look to see whether there is inconsistent or conflicting results. And you know, based on these factors, a product claim may need to be qualified. And it's important to keep in mind that the qualified claim would need to be communicated to consumers in an accurate and understandable way. From our view, it's important not to make a claim if a weight of the evidence contradicts the claim, or if a qualified claim can't be effectively communicated in the advertising. Now that I've run through FTC's two-step process for analyzing health claims, let me touch upon how our approach to health claims intersects with that of the FDA. The FTC's authority over the marketing of foods and supplements, as well as drugs, devices, and cosmetics, overlaps with that of the FDA. Our agencies have a long-standing memorandum of understanding under which FDA has primary authority over claims made in labeling, and FTC has primary authority over claims made in advertising. And as I mentioned earlier, advertising covers a broad range of marketing activities. Some key differences between FTC and FDA regulation of health products are first that FTC is primarily a law enforcement agency, so we don't do pre-market approval of health claims. Second, FTC doesn't make a regulatory distinction between the types of health products or the types of health claims. We follow the same two-step analysis I just described, regardless of whether a product is classified under FDA law as a drug, a supplement, or food. Similarly, we use that same analysis regardless of whether a claim is classified as a structure function claim under FDA law. The provisions of the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act regarding structure function claims and supplement labeling don't apply to FTC's assessment of those health claims in advertising. While there are these regulatory distinctions, both FTC and FDA require health claims to be truthful and accurate, and FDA substantiation guidance for structure function claims closely mirrors that 
of FTC's substantiation policy. Finally, I'd like to take a few minutes to highlight recent FTC policy and enforcement developments in the area of health advertising. In 2022, FTC staff published a compliance guidance document for industry to replace a 1998 guidance that pertains specifically to dietary supplement advertising. A purpose of the update was to draw from our experience investigating and litigating health claim cases over the last 24 years in order to expand on the fact pattern examples offered in the original guidance. I highly recommend reading the 2022 guidance, which is available on the FTC website. It covers in greater detail the principles that I've addressed today and provides numerous examples to illustrate key points. The guidance also makes clear that these principles apply not only to supplements, but also to other health products like foods, OTC drugs, homeopathic products, health equipment, diagnostic tests, and health apps. The document is a compliance guidance, but is not a safe harbor from liability. Whether health product advertising is deceptive is a very fact-specific analysis. In the past year, several marketers of supplements and other health products have entered consent decrees with the FTC. Let's first talk about Zycal Bioceuticals. We challenged Zycal's claims that cyplexanol, a proprietary ingredient in its bone and joint oral supplements, could grow bone and cartilage and relieve joint pain. Among other things, Zycal claimed that these health benefits were proven and cited their own clinical research. It was the FTC's position that the published human research sponsored by the company and published in non-indexed journals, fell far short of competent and reliable scientific evidence. It included case studies, uncontrolled studies, and studies presented as randomized controlled trials, but which on their face had many methodological and reporting flaws. Several of the publications were co-authored by Zycal's CEO. Zycal and its CEO signed an FTC order barring them from making such claims unless supported by sound clinical studies. Deutera International. Deutera is a multi-level marketing company that sells essential oils and dietary supplements. The Department of Justice, on behalf of the FTC, sued three doTERRA distributors for making claims in webinars that their products could treat or prevent COVID-19. The orders require each of the defendants to stop making any COVID treatment or prevention claims not approved by the FDA. Each defendant also must pay a $15,000 civil penalty for violating the COVID-19 Consumer Protection Act. and AwareMed. This is another case brought by DOJ on behalf of the FTC. DOJ sued the medical clinic AwareMed and its owner for making deceptive claims for addiction and cancer treatment services, as well as treatment of other serious conditions. The consent decrees prohibit the defendants from violating the FTC Act or the Opioid Recovery Fraud Prevention Act and requires them to pay a $100,000 civil penalty. These cases illustrate that we bring enforcement actions against all kinds of business entities, manufacturers, MLM distributors, medical businesses, and against individuals who participate in or have authority to control the marketing practices. These examples also highlight the various remedies that the FTC may seek. For example, order provisions that prohibit future deceptive advertising, that ban health claims that require FDA approval, and provisions that include financial remedies. 
Recently, the FTC has been using its penalty offense authority to put potential wrongdoers on notice of certain types of conduct that the Commission has found unlawful. Under Section 5M of the FTC Act, the Commission can obtain substantial civil penalties, currently over $50,000 per violation, if it proves that a company, one, knew that its conduct was unfair or deceptive under the Act, and two, that there is already an FTC administrative decision that has found such conduct to be unfair or deceptive. Now, in order to satisfy the first element that a company knew the conduct violated FTC law, the Commission has been sending companies notices of penalty offenses. We have sent NPOs to many different companies on many different topics, most recently on health claim substantiation. Last month, the Commission staff sent approximately 670 NPOs to marketers of health products. The NPOs explain FTC substantiation requirements, but receipt of an NPO does not mean that a company has violated the law. Think of it rather as a flashing caution signal to companies of steps to take to ensure they don't violate FTC law on health claim advertising. In closing, I want to provide you with a few resources on the FTC website, as well as links to the Health Products Compliance Guidance and Notice of Penalty Offenses that I discussed today. It has been a pleasure talking with you today, and here's my contact information in case you have questions. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Barry. That was very interesting. A lot of good information in there. Uh, so we do have several questions that came in um, and I will just uh, start right from the beginning. Dr. Johnson, what about a claim of maintaining healthy glucose levels in pre-diabetic individuals? Would this be hinting at the actual disease diabetes too much? Um, yeah, I think, you know, as I mentioned, we look at the, first of all, the first step is looking at the net impression of the whole ad. And so, yes, we would look at those claims and the references to pre-diabetic patients and, you know, perhaps images and other, um, other wording in the ad, you know, may lead to a conclusion that uh, the takeaway, a consumer takeaway, a reasonable takeaway would be um, a diabetes claim. It really is very fact specific. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can the FTC detect and act on subconscious advertisement practices as, for example, greater than two second flashed product presentations within TV advertisement campaigns? Um, I'm trying to visualize uh, what that would look like, but again, um, I would say that it, I, we would look at to the net impression. So it is it is certainly possible that, and also we would look at not just necessarily that one advertisement for the product, but what other advertising is the company doing, um, you know, even aside from that one flash advertisement. Uh, so it really is a more sort of comprehensive look at the company's marketing activities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can consumers report companies for FTC oversight and request documentation of structure function claims? So um, sounds like there are two questions there. First, in terms of reporting companies to the FTC for oversight, um, certainly we have a mechanism for uh, co other companies, consumers, uh, anyone to file a complaint. Um, through our website um, regarding claims that they see 
that they believe are you know problematic or deceptive. Um, and we have a database that we look at um, to, um, and we look at that routinely, uh, as well as we do our own um, investigation. So yes, um, and you know we would encourage anyone to report that kind of activity uh, through the FTC website. In terms of the structure function claims, could you just repeat that part of the question? Uh, can consumers uh, request documentation of structure function claims? Well, um, again, F FTC, um, we don't really, we don't maintain a sort of a repository of structure function claims um, because as I mentioned, we don't, really distinguish between structure function and other types of claims. So um, our investigations are non-public. Um, so while we have the, you know, we have the authority to seek um, backup documentation of uh, substantiation and marketing materials from companies um, as part of sort of a subpoena process, um, that information is not public um, and, uh, what ends up being public is perhaps, you know, a settlement with the company or information that's filed in court. Got it. Okay, um, another one. If the FTC does not require that the research used to substantiate claims used in advertising are in the public domain, how could researchers determine what research was used to substantiate these claims? Oh, that is a very good question. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, one avenue would be to go to the, to seek it directly from the company. Um, it depends also on what the company has stated in their advertising is their substantiation. Um, um, you know, that that is a very difficult question. I'm not sure I have a, a great answer off the top of my head. I might need to think more about that. <laughs> Fair enough. I think you can add add to your answer to that question after sure. the after the practicum. Um, would wet lab experiments without clinical evidence suffice to substantiate a claim? So uh, again, since I'm not a scientist, by wet lab, um, does that mean, for example, um, animal or you know in vitro? Uh, I would think bench science generally. Yeah. Um, Generally, not to um, it would not support a health claim for use of the product consumed by humans, um, which is you know usually what the dietary supplement or food products are are being marketed for. Um, you know, certainly it provides relevant uh, scientific information about the safety um, of the product, um, but I, we would not look at that as sufficient uh, on its own to support um, a health claim. And again, we're not scientists, but we, we, know, we work with experts in the relevant field. So that's what we would look to. And I don't believe in our experience, in my experience, that is not something that experts um, in the field would, would rely on. Yeah, okay, um, sounds reasonable. So this is a question uh, the individual says, I'd like to address this question to both Ms. Johnson and to Ms. Voss. Please comment on the difference between the very detailed FDA guidance on claim substantiation and the FTC's reliance on human clinical studies. Um, well, I guess I'll, I can start with that. Um, I can't really speak to, to FDA specific um, guidance, but I mean, I can say that I, I do believe our substantiation requirements um, are aligned in that, you know, um, we do look to um, competent, reliable scientific evidence. Um, and, you know, I've outlined um, in the slides some of the qualities that that kind of research requires. Um, Jeria uh, Voss, I don't know if you have further thoughts on that. I don't think Jerry's here. 
Oh, okay. Well, um, again, maybe that's something that you know either or both of you can add to to later. Um, but uh, I think you know you gave a fair answer, Mary. Thank you. Um, so this is a question. I'm not. I think I'm interpreting interpreting it correctly. Uh, so is the study for the ingredient or for the finished product? Uh, a lot of the words, I think he's saying structure function claims for the FDA are for the dietary ingredient or component uh, and not for the finished product. So I, I think the question is when the FTC does its study, is uh, you, you, you investigate the, the claim for the ingredient or for the finished product? Well, I mean, they, uh, if a company is selling, they're selling a finished product to consumers and we would look at what is the science um, to support um, the claims for that finished product. Um, you know, perhaps that finished product is essentially one, you know, a proprietary ingredient or perhaps if it's a multi-ingredient product, um, you know, we will, we in, cons in consultation with experts, certainly look at what is the uh, ingredient specific science. However, you know, if it's marketed as a combination, there may be interactions between the ingredients. There may be some synergistic effect of different ingredients when put in combination. So we do look at the finished product as well. Okay. Uh, let's see. So what is the validity of the health claims once the clinical study has been successfully completed supporting those claims? Um, well, uh, I'm not, if I understand the question correctly, I mean, we certainly would look at um, what is the support you know, of that particular study, which is as described, it would, it sounds like it would be a high quality study, but we wouldn't just look at that in isolation. So, you know, we do want to look at also, you know, what is the body of scientific evidence, relevant scientific evidence, and is that one study um, in sync, um, you know, or is there contradictory evidence out there? Um, so I would just want to emphasize, we don't look at uh, the studies in isolation. Okay. So um, someone brings up, um, uh, says recently, I know that there was an FTC warning for over 700 companies and they provide a, a URL to that press release. Um, uh, what was the impetus for this? And um, is there a change in regulation we should know about? Um, it's possible the person is referring to the notice of penalty offenses that I just mentioned, um, in which uh, we sent um, maybe close to 700, um, what we'll, I'll call NPOs, um, to companies to really put them on alert about um, what FTC law says about health claim substantiation. Um, and a reason for doing that um, is that, you know, then in the future, we would have the ability to take uh, specific enforcement action, perhaps against a company um, for knowing that they had, they were aware of first of all, if we found that there were actual violations of the act, um, that knowing that they were aware of the law and that they violated it. Um, but the notices themselves are not uh, indication that a company has in fact violated the act. Um, it's really, it, I'd think it serves two purposes. One, to notify industry, relevant industry of what their responsibilities are for substantiation, um, as well as consumers, you know, um, just the, at least the press release, putting that out, letting people know that um, that is what FTC um, has sent. Okay, thank you. I, I, I think you did respond to the, uh, the story that they were talking about, so I clicked on the link. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, if clinical evidence is provided, via a clinical trial to substantiate the efficacy claim, 
then would this product qualify as a drug rather than dietary supplement? What is the line that separates the dietary supplement from a drug? Um, again, this may also be a better question for FDA as well, but I mean, it really, it depends on what you, what claims you're making, um, you know, uh, what the intended use is of your product. FTC, we don't really make a distinction between drug versus supplement. Um, we look at, you know, what is the claim being made and then what kind of support do you have for that claim? Um, so we don't really have a sort of a bright line um, category distinction. Okay. Looks um, like I have one more question. I have one more minute, so I'll ask it. Uh, did the Supreme Court rule against FTC about the POM case saying only one clinical trial was needed? So, um, they didn't rule against the FTC. They did actually affirm the um, the commission's decision in that case. Um, and in that case, based on those facts, uh, at least one clinical study, one well-controlled, well-designed clinical study, um, is required. Was required in that case. Okay, I, I think we covered ninety-nine. 9% of the questions. Um, if there are any that came in that I didn't see, we will answer them after the practicum. Oh, Mary, thank you very much. Um, thank you. A lot of good information and um, you know, great responses to the questions that came in. So uh, thank you. And that'll wrap up the session. Thank Thanks you, so Patricia. Much. Thank you, Mary. Um, okay, so we are going to take a 15 minute break and then we're going to come back to our breakout sessions. The only problem is we have a little hiccup with the breakout sessions um, and to get around it, what we're gonna have to do is um, we're gonna put a new link for the breakout sessions in the chat, but you also should have received an email with that new link uh, just to use today for the breakout session. Um, so you should have received it in your email, um, the email address that you used to initially register for the practicum. So hopefully everybody got that, but we're also, um, James has just put it in the chat box too. This is one link, everybody can use it. My email um, is preventing me from sending it to 600 plus people. So uh, I put it in the chat and I can uh, repost it a bunch of times. Okay. Um, James, will we leave this session open then? I'll, I'll leave it running so I can keep posting it if anyone uh, is still looking. Okay, great. Yep. So um, I think, you know, again, just use this um, link, um, then you will be put into a new uh, Zoom and you will then have um, the chance to select which breakout session you want. And we have breakout session 1A, which is dietary supplements and, and uh, nutrition research grants. And then we have another one on special topics. And this includes a presentation from um, the U.S. Department of Defense and also resilience research at um, ODS. Uh, so that's it. Um, again, just use this link for today. Go back to the regular Zoom link for tomorrow at 11 a.m. All right. And so we will reconvene at three. There we go. Okay. Reconvene at three in the other meeting. Just for clarity for the yeah, audience. In the other meeting. <laughs> <laughs>